first and foremost recording in progress tk happy Merry new year new year holy wow. smokes what a year Daryl! crazy what a, year. What a ride bro that 2020 was ride. crazy <laughs> i don't even remember 2020 what the f- what happened in 2020 was that when the when the big p word started yeah that was crazy this whole this has been like a big long blur hasn't it I think that um, 2020 was a memorable year and that memorable. people thought, thought it was, you know, it couldn't get worse from here. You know, 2021, it was like, psych. We were, <laughs> we were all destined for greatness. Everybody's a genius. Everybody's a genius in 2021. Genius. 2022. Oh my gosh. Holy shit. I can't believe everything on? everyone was telling me was true. Oh. I really should be more careful. Oh, my God. Cash is trash. Where the fuck did that come from, right? Since when? <laughs> you, you mean you mean I'm only going to lose 200 bucks a month if I if I buy that condo? Seems like a good deal to me because, look, the price is going to be else like could... $3 billion next year. By, by the t- At this rate of appreciation, I mean, this condo is going to be worth at least $7 million by Dude. the time I retire. We all fell for it. Yeah. And now... Boom. Tiff. Dun, dun, dun. Drum roll. Rug pull. Boom. Rug pull. <laughs> Rug pull. Here we go. See you later. That's Jesus what it is, though. You know, that's what it is, though. It's all this, it's all this um delusional. Um, you know, everything's always gonna go a certain way. There's no way I can lose. Somebody told me so. You mm. know, history always repeats itself. Here we are in the midst of it, dealing with the repercussions. And I'm telling you. We haven't seen nothing yet. Yeah, yeah there's repercussions. We have not there's, seen nothing I'm trying to explain yet. that to people right now, and they're all just kind of like, mm, you sure? You sure? And I'm like, believe you me. There yeah. is some stuff coming. How much you want to pay for that house you live in there? How much do you want to pay for that house you live in? Mm-hmm. Right? And how long do you want to live in that house that you live in? Yeah. How long can you live in that house that you live in? Right? Yeah. And so like... How great is that job you've got? <laughs> How stable is that job you've got? What industry yeah. are you in? Exactly. Yeah. Whoa. All kinds of shakedowns lots, going on. Lots of, lots of things going on. But man, we have such an amazing show today. I'm so Holy excited. Holy cow. I don't know what to, I don't even know what to say. I don't know how to introduce. We've got guests. That's all I can lots tell you. Lots and lots of guests and, and all one better than the next. They're all great. They're, They're all great. great. Guests. And that's what's crazy. No particular like, order today. No particular order. No, just, uh, just as they jump in, they get to uh, have a seat at the table until they, yeah. I guess, want to jump out or I guess, and maybe we might have to ask them waiting. to leave. I don't know. We yeah. might, there, there might be a time where we say, Hey, you know, thank you. We got lots Thanks. of people on the go. Happy new year. Happy. That's the way it goes. This new is what our year. listeners want. They want, they want a, a full turnstile of guests for the end of the year review. That's what I today. hope it's a today happy the end of new the year, year review or it's like a 2023 it's just a big hodgepodge of God knows what we'll see Tw- where it goes. I mean, TK 2023 What's our plans. Happen? Look, our plans rarely come, come to fruition and we certainly. Yeah. And what's the, what's the saying? Mm. We make plans and uh, the gods laugh. Yeah. Man makes plans and, and the gods, and the gods laugh. laugh. Yeah. The podcast gods. The podcast and, uh, gods. The podcaster plans. They're two different things. Every plan I have ever made, TK, <laughs> has not gone according well, to Well, shout out to you for making the plan in the first place. Well, there you go. Daryl's studio has got just whiteboards and blackboards and charts, and uh, you should see it. It's just, it's just unreal. It's unreal. It's a madhouse over there. Madhouse. We are going to bring in our first guest of the afternoon morning really but mm. uh here we go santo sessa wait hello there he is in audio form oh you don't see me sorry one second here we go here we go mm. okay Ooh, there we go look at that guy all right Hi. so how are you very good how are happy you new year mister. yeah 
Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy, happy birthday happy, to Mrs. Happy Sessa. Happy birthday. Yeah. I happy. will pass on the message. There's things happening in the other room getting ready for that. Some samosas uh, in the other room. We got samosas. Actually, we do have we samosas. Do. <laughs> awesome. We, Great. We do yeah. have samosas. We got uh, my mother, my wife's mother coming over. Beautiful. Uh, Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got a, a few things going and on. And you're just taking a moment to be a guest on a podcast. No big on deal. On this stupid show. Thank no, you so no much. No big deal. Just guys, I got to go do a quick little interview. I'll be back, right? Man, we appreciate that Life so is much. Santa's been on the that. show a couple of times already, hasn't you he? Guys, you guys, you know what you guys are putting times. together is awesome here. So how how can Thank I you. say no? Well, awesome. we really we appreciate it. it. We love it. So we Santa's one questions. of our 14 subs. This is amazing. Yeah, and are, we, on the show. are we live right now? I'm not sure. What always. We're always we're always <laughs> just rocking and rolling, man. We can't. I, I made sure my hair was all ready for when we go live here. Better, I don't know. We're live. Than ever. You, for you. you jumped Better. the gun. So we get like extra time with you. This is a bonus for everybody, I think. Yeah, uh, you can. And it'll give I'm us, the lucky one. Thank it'll you. It'll give though. us an opportunity to figure out how, how the rest of today is going to go um but how, like, how did you feel about 2022 here. How, how overall how, how did you feel about 2022 what was what did it mean to you what was it to you you gotta give me a category um okay. so category if, real estate if uh <laughs> <laughs> oh that's surprising you ask about real estate let mm -hmm. me see um i thought it was very necessary i thought everything that's happened Lots of people, me included, have been thinking, holy shit, how high can it continue to go? And like, uh, you know, like a, a, a clock where you, you take the battery out, it's still right twice a day. So all these people for years, not, you know, one or two months, but for years and years and years that have been saying it's not sustainable, it's got to come down. People that have been talking about that for 10 years now, since since. Remember 2016, how crazy things went. Yeah. Um, they're finally right. And and it was just a matter of time and prices uh, have have now adjusted, I guess. So, you know, I, I, I honestly, this is the honest truth. I don't see bad markets, good markets. I don't feel like that. If I feel like that, I, I really shouldn't be in a real estate business, to be honest. There's always opportunity, whatever the market's doing. And um, is it the right time to buy? Is it the right time to sell? Is it the right time to invest? That's always a, a personal choice based on someone's own set of personal circumstances. And my job is to is to help people do that. So, you know, 2022 has been a great year for us. Um, we've met and spoken with some awesome, awesome people, more people than uh, that the, people need more information now. So uh, those people that can can help can guide, uh, I think, are better off in, in markets where there's a lot of uncertainty versus, say, if we're talking real estate and we're talking realtors. There's a lot of transactional realtors out there. They're they're really good at doing the paperwork. And they're really good at, you know, they could put a listing together. They could take you to houses. They could say, let's go see this one. But when you get really behind the scenes and in, in maybe some of the planning, some of the strategy, it's in these types of markets that, that, that the people that are really good stand out. And a lot of them are guests on your show. You guys do a great job of bringing good people together. Thank you. Beautiful. You you said hey. something. You said um, a lot of people uh, were talking about the prices changing, and you said they have adjusted. Are they still adjusting? Yeah, you're, I noticed you were guy. talking in like like past mm -hmm. tense there. You said it happened, and mm -hmm. you know it sounds like you think it's behind us, but <laughs> you know, you well, look, also, you're the you're you guys the are also guy. experts at at putting people in a corner. Uh, we just want to know the data. We don't want to know about your predictions. We just want to know what does the data show from the last, you know, well, few if weeks. We're talking, if we're talking, you know, if we're talking, say, say the peak. I mean, at some point we're gonna 
stop talking about the peak. Um, just like we stop talking. Remember Y2K? I saw something on TV the other day <laughs> of a Y2K. At some yeah. point, we stop talking about Y2K like it was a thing. At some mm-hmm. point, we're going to stop talking about the peak like it was a thing. And um, so we are down and we're talking city of Toronto, detached market. We're down about th- approximately 33% from the peak. Oh, oh. 20, 20, 20, just under where, if I remember, I got all these numbers in my head, about 29% down. Sales are down about 33% um, uh, year over year. Listings are down about 10% year over year. Like, do I think it's behind us? I think, okay, so you're asking me not to predict, but this is exactly what you're asking for. We are here for prediction. Hey, Mr. Steve uh, Karish in the house. All I, all I said was what's going on in the last few weeks. So, you know, I want to predict. What, well, what's going on is what you expect to be going on at Christmas time. Uh, Nothing. Things are a lot slower. There's still transactions going on. We just finished doing one actually, but it's very, very quiet as it normally is this time of year. Beautiful. Santo, we want to wish you a happy new year. We want to wish your wife a happy birthday. Happy birthday. Enjoy the samosas and the party today. And we're going to just roll into our next uh, guest today. And You can stick around for a bit too, though. You want to stick in. Yeah, Yeah. no problem. But just let you know that uh, today, this is what we're doing. He predicted. I wanted a rates prediction. He said, we're wrong, Daryl, and we don't have to worry about it. I'll tell you what I feel is going to happen. I'll tell you what I feel. Prices and rates from Santo Sessa, the numbers guy for 2023. <laughs> so I think, and this is, you know, part of it, you know, when it comes to predictions, a lot of people I find, myself included, we predict kind of what we'd like to see happening. Absolutely. <laughs> but but I, I predict that rates are going to go up a little bit more and then they're going to stop. I'm thinking in the middle of the year, they're going to stop. I'm thinking sales dollar wise, uh, sales and uh, prices, I think they're going to stay quite stable for most of the year. And I would say the time to really, really watch is going to be fall next year. That's just my guess. So most of the year, yeah, a little up, little down, depending on the area. I don't see much change from where we are now for most of the year. The fall though, I, I think all bets are off. I, I'm going to, it's to me anyways, it's going to be really interesting what happens in the fall, but that's just Suspenseful. my, my oh. thoughts. Yeah. Interesting. You know, could mean those anything. Are my thoughts. Could mean anything. That's the way I see could it. Be up, I see could be it. down. Could be nothing. Could be, it. could be yeah. sideways. I th- yeah. I'm hoping for sideways. God. Well, Mr. Santo Sessa, thank you so thank much you. for your time, sir. Merry new year. Happy Christmas. Happy birthday. Guys, we have a what a week! What a week of people! This is unbelievable. What a week! Wishing, wishing you, your guests, your viewers, nothing but health and prosperity for 2023. Thank you for putting Thank all you, this Santa. together. Thanks, pal. We'll, we'll see Mr. you in the new year. See you guys see you next year, buddy. Mister Karish, how are you, sir? Bye bye. Thanks, What's Santa. Going on, lighting fellas. Today. Look at this lighting. This Look is at so the festive. lighting and the yeah. beautiful audio. Look at this guy. This guy. Clean. You were voted. The people voted that you were gonna get to ten thousand before uh, before Tom. Have they done that? I don't think that's true. I ooh, I saw it with my own eyes. I saw it with my own eyes. Crush Maybe Tom's story, but I, <laughs> I think you. I think you will. This What's is one of the, you guys. You know, oh my God. we're hanging out, just hanging keeping out. it real. New Year's, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Holidays are Happy going well for you. New Year. Everything's gone good. Uh, busier than I thought I'd be at this time of year, which is crazy. No, not writing transactions, but man, there's people getting ready to do stuff in the new year, both buyers and sellers. So everybody's still waiting. Is, what does that mean? What does that mean? People are everybody's waiting. Waiting. What are they doing? Are they painting or what are they doing? Are they, are there, they there's getting a pre-approved? Lot of painting. There's yeah. a lot of painting. There's a lot of cleaners. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of painting and cleaning going on. A lot of new I, toilets. That's serious. I, Once painting and cleaning starts, that's. You know who's making out like bandits right now is cleaners. If you want to get, if all you realtors right. out there, they're going to have a tough year. Go get paid 40, <laughs> 50 bucks an hour to be a cleaner. To that be is cleaner. where it's at right now. To do basically nothing and just have the clients complain about the job they do. Hey, just like real estate. I was going to say, I there's like an interesting comparison there. It never ever sweep, works right? out. So yeah. I must be an amazing cleaner. That'll be my next career. Yeah, uh, it never, cleaner. it never seems to work out uh, with the cleaners, unfortunately. 
Good morning, Donna. Have you oh, ever had to resort? Happy New Year. Have you ever had to resort in your career to being a cleaner? <laughs> oh my Donna's God. Has it, it ever got that bad? Donna's done it all. I have cleaned so <laughs> many houses. You have no idea. You know, there was a time that I would have this really heavy duty cleaning kit in my car. And when I went to a house to do an open house, I would, you know, say goodbye to the people. Then I would clean, right? you know, like clean the fingerprints off the stove. And, mm, and it, that smart. was a time before staging and everything. And it was like, oh my gosh, you know, you look and there'd be like, and, and they'd say, oh, we spent like the whole weekend just cleaning. And then you'd walk in. Mm -hmm. oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Cleaning yeah. Yeah. what? <laughs> yeah. And then sometimes too, if it, if it was a tenanted property and, and the people had moved out, you know, the cleaning, the whole, um, you know, Betty Crocker spotless stuff. That's only been within the past decade, you know, with the staging, at least in, in the Hamilton area, 10, 15 years prior to that, it was like, Oh, you know, just like now they stay, people spend countless hours staging the bed. You know, I sold houses when you just pulled up the bed. You mean the cardboard and... boxes with the yeah. sheets on top? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Steve, yeah. Steve doesn't strike me as a guy that carries around cleaning supplies, but no, uh... Steve. I, I don't know. I haven't, man. I haven't met Steve before. Hey, uh, Steve, meet Donna. Donna, Steve, Donna meets Steve. Steve. Donna. Hi, yeah. Steve. We're we're Hamilton to Surrey right now. That's pretty cool. Ooh, Surrey, BC. Yeah, I'm yeah. moving on up. Okay, and I'm broadcasting <laughs> from New Brunswick, right from the hills oh, of New wow. Brunswick. Oh, look, look at this coast, coast to coast. To coast. coast. And I know. And I know. Hey, I think we could probably start a radio show at that coast to coast. Okay. Hope it's not taken. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, we've got a few questions for Steve. So Steve, yeah. you know, 2022, like how, how was this year for you? And I don't mean like your business wise, but how did you feel about the sort of results and the events that happened over the, the course of the year? Mm. The results, if it's not in my business, in what manner then? That's right. Well, I'm talking about the, the results of the interest rate hikes, sales slowing like on down, the prices market. having a, a, a change. The, a the story of 2022 is nobody saw the amount of interest rate increases we needed coming. That's the story. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we all made predictions based on um, a lot lower rate hikes than what we got. Right. I mean, I'm in one of those areas that is down. Some of the markets I service in detached is down 40% mm -hmm. from peak, from oh. peak to trough. Right. We just had Santo on and told us 30% is the GTA average for detached. Oh, so, God. but here, I mean, the part that gets lost there Ugh. is how many people bought at that peak. It's a very small amount of people. Um, That's I a just, good point, actually. It, it's how not small. Well, we all pretend that absolutely everyone right. uh, bought a what is now a one point six million dollar uh, house in my neighborhood for two million dollars. Right. They all didn't do that. Very, right. very few of them did it. That was the problem. There was so few listings. That that's what caused it to go that way. Like I think we jumped something like fifteen percent in the first two months of this last year, and then of course we lost. Uh, you know, let's call it in my market or in my particular area, twenty five percent. So you know, are we that much different than this time last year? Not really. Um, are we that much different from the peak? For sure. So that was the story of this last year. Nobody saw that coming. I think we're going to be relatively okay because still right now what's a what's a five-year fixed right now tk i want to say four seven nine four eight nine something like that yeah everybody's still qualified at five and a quarter so we should be fine except for the fact that you know groceries now cost 17 times what they did last year so there's other expenses but housing expense as long as you're not going crazy most people should be fine What's what's your ideal market then to be working in? Like we we really had quite like a few different markets this year. I'd say now we're in like a third phase, right? It was like A and then it was B and now we're in C. Like which market do, do you prefer to be working in? I mean, I, I think when I was on your show earlier the year, I said like from a listing agent point of view, I love the certainty of the market we were in. Knowing we were going to have an offer and then we were going to work, you know, this uh, amount of time on a listing it created certainty and that was great i really though think we should get back to the market that i kind of came up in which was the you know 2009 to 2014 market where stuff was regular right stuff was like you would have listings expire right you would have 30 percent of your listings expire 
that would be fine by me. I mean, that's not a good business plan necessarily, but if that's the market, that's the market. It should not be a hundred and twelve percent average list to sell ratio. <laughs> that's not good for anybody. Um, and fifty offers on a property. Where did those buyers go? Like, yeah. where did, where are they living now? But I mean, all of all the properties we're still selling now. I think this year, over the average uh, for my not my market, but for my personal business, I'm still at like seventeen days on market. That is still a very wow. very Fantastic. Good that's market. quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How, right. What's the so, days on market in Hamilton right now? So I think that this month it's going to come out above 30, you know, uh, that it's been moving up 30. It really depends what class you're looking in. So, you know, is that uh, single family residential, not including condominiums, uh, you know, so the, the condo market uh, is, is looking a little bit on the soft side, but, you know, Hamilton, it's, if we look at the market as being location, and I don't know uh, where where Steve, where do you work in, Steve? What area? Is Surrey, BC? Did I hear you? Yeah, Lower Mainland yeah. of BC. Yeah, so Hamilton is like the the more the bad neighborhood of Toronto, you know. So if if people, you know, want uh, you know dollar for dollar, if they can afford it, they'll take Toronto. If if that's their, you know, if. if that's if they're working um, in middle uh, middle executive or, or upper executive positions. So Toronto rules. And then Hamilton does have good areas and bad areas. So, you know, what happened over the last uh, two years is those markets really got conflated. So, you know, they, I, I heard a lot of agents say, you know, that bad area is now the new good area, right? <laughs> well, you know, people sure. are waking up and it's no. not really, it's, it's, it's like, <laughs> they'll find oh, out once they move in. Oh, and damn the price it. That the they bad pay. area is back yeah. again. I don't mind being you on know? a busy street. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's no so, big deal. You know, who cares about the drug dealers? So yeah. that those, those prices coming down drastically, that's really skewing the, the market, right? You know, so so we're seeing that repositioning. It's just going back to where it should have been. It never should have got up there that, you know, that house down uh, in the lower city should never have been selling for on the mountain and that house on the mountain should never have been selling for what it, you could buy in Toronto for. Yeah. So I think we're just seeing that repositioning and uh, people who can borrow the money are being very selective. So, you know, the, the, the houses I looked at last night kind of extensively, the houses that were selling and those houses would have sold for a hundred, $150,000 more. And um, at the beginning of the year or this time last year, but because they're down where the average price was, you know, moving those, those numbers are skewed as well. So it's not, what's the average price? It's what are you getting for the average price? right. That people should look at mm -hmm. is that, you know, that's what, that's what uh, 750 bought us last year and look what 750 buy is buying us this year. So we, we want to make sure we get Steve's questions out here yeah. because I know that he's got a million listings to put up and, and houses to clean, but Steve, 2023, what uh, you know, what do you see in, in the new year? What's Prices, to watch sales, out volume for? rates, uh, activity, sentiment, whatever topic you want to talk about. Um, I'm, kind of alluding to what I said earlier, I'm shocked at how many people are reaching out to say, Hey, we're coming to Surrey and we're heading your way and we're interested in buying from where, um, uh, right now from Ontario, I've got, I spoke to somebody yesterday from the sunshine coast, which is semi-local. Um, but all people around all walks of life. Um, and they're just what makes sense. Now there is those people that are thinking like, okay, well it, the market's down 30%. So that 1.2 house, I'm going to get that for 900. And that's not the way it works because that 1.2 house was 1.6. So we got to do a lot of education. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm, I'm shocked at the amount of people that want to still get in. That's where I think the big difference is between uh, now and 2008 and now, and I, even though I wasn't around for it in our market, 1981 was a big crash. I, I spoke to a developer the other day that was around in 1981. And his thing was like, in 1981, you did anything you could to get out of your projects. Anything. Right. Anything. And he's like, I don't see that now. If anything, he has more guys going, you got any good projects you can flip to me? 
Really? And I think that's the biggest thing. I don't think we're going to see the, the doom and nastiness that everybody thinks we're going to see. I think everybody's generally fine. I think we're going to return to a state of hopefully normalcy. And um, I think interest rates will mess around for a while in and around. I wouldn't be shocked if our interest rates are exactly this spot <clears throat> this time next year. Just depends on whatever the inflation does. I think um, the Bank of Canada is going to probably take a much more measured approach. Like we're probably going to see quarter up, quarter down if we see anything at all. Um, we're meaning each adjustment will probably hopefully only be a quarter point at a time, right? That should give us some more certainty rather than seeing like a 1% interest rate increase like we saw on like my birthday this year, July 13th. That's not normal. That's not where we should be, right? We shouldn't be seeing those um, crazy spikes. And that that was a shock to the system for a lot of us. Absolutely. Here's hear more volume then. Hoping for quarter point increases next year, baby. Let's do you go think, quarter do you guys points. Think we're going to see that. Do you guys sure. think we're going to see in, uh, quarter point increases? For sure, we are. At least well, one. Yeah, do you, I'm, do you I'm, think I'm we're going to see anything crazy? Yeah, nothing drastic. What we we've already seen the drastic rate uh, changes, right? Okay. They're just, mm-hmm. just not necessary so. anymore. I don't know. There, People there are still, still be a long term change. I'm not saying the rates couldn't go up shit. much further, but it'll be a very small increments, if anything. People right? and are, like you said, measured approach. I like that. That's a good term. It's going to be a much are, more measured approach because they really want to make sure that they're uh, doing the right things and not overshooting the mark. I think people are stupid and they're still spending and the Bank of Canada may have to give us another shot across the bow. Yeah. Well, Mr. There Parrish, feel free to stick Steve, around. anytime. We yeah, Tom we appreciate you. Happy New now. Year. Still have Donna Backer. This is crazy. We got a lineup forming here. Tom, TK. welcome. I don't know what welcome. to do, bro. I knew this was going to get out of hand. This is great, though. Anybody feel free to jump in at any point to say anything. Tom, how's it going? Thanks for joining us on the road. Yeah, it's uh, it's going well. My Wi-Fi is a little shoddy out here, but I wanted to jump on and wish everybody a happy new year and see if you guys can hear me all right. We can hear you perfect. Loud and clear, man. Happy, happy new, year. new year, buddy. Thanks for Absolutely. taking the time. Appreciate it. We know uh, did, you're a busy did Steve guy. Did Steve say anything interesting or, or nothing, nothing like usual? Zero. Mm. You know what? We, we noticed though on the poll that went up that uh, the people think Steve's going to outpace you. Is that may, th- did the bots uh, flip think, that? Did the bots? I flip think that Steve's yet? got like ten fake accounts, 10 fake and he accounts votes on our own polls. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> well, you guys are both killing it together, which is amazing. Look at this. We got where? Where are you? You're up north in like Muskoka or something. Are you on? No, I'm actually east. I'm in. Uh, I'm looking at Lake Ontario right now. So Lake I'm like Ontario. on the way to Prince Edward County area. We got New Brunswick, Donna's in New Surrey, Brunswick. all at the same Her time. Vacation property, Steve. We got Surrey. Patrick Francie's going to jump in. He's from Alberta, so we're going to just cover the country right now. All Donna, we want to kind of hear from you out, yeah. out of the markets that you've worked in the past. You know, what's your ideal market to be working in? You know, prices going up, prices going down small increases, lots of inventory, buyer's market selling. Like what would you define as being the most ideal environment um, that you could be operating your business in? Well, I think that uh, when the, like inflation is the, that's the killer, okay, inflation. So when households are faced with inflation, when there's financial stress, et cetera, those, bec- those become very difficult markets to work in, uh, difficult markets to navigate. So, you know, that's kind of where we are right now, inflation, fluctuating interest rates. My Probably the, the best uh, markets that I think I've ever worked in has been, you know, that uh, 2013 to 2015 market before it took off, where where there was some predictability. So, you know, prices weren't getting haywire. You knew when you sold a house for, you know, five hundred thousand dollars that it was going to be that your people weren't going to be underwater interest rate. Like so th- those stable markets for a realtor, in my opinion, are the are the uh, the nicest markets to sell in. And. And then on the flip side of that, when you get uncertainty and, uh, you know, and what we've experienced here in the past two years and now rising inflation, those become very, not only uh, difficult markets, but they, in my opinion, they become very dangerous markets for agents. So if you're going to get your ass in court, 
on anything, it's going to be in one of these markets. Okay. So, uh, you know, no one wants in, to in can, court. What's that? Nobody wants to end up in court. That's right. Because it's the yeah. blame game, right? You know, everything was going great. And then all of a sudden there's, you get pulled into things. And then when, as an agent, when you get pulled into those things, you're not out there making money. So, uh, you know, there's that aspect. So I would say of all the time that I've, I've, that I've worked in real estate, my most favorite time was 19, when I first started 1983 to like 1986, then things got really crazy. And then uh, once again, um, after the financial crisis in the States, so 2012 to 2015. Beautiful, beautiful. Pa Patrick's just joined us. Welcome, Patrick. Happy New Year. Happy New yeah, Year. Happy New Year, guys. We're going to try and us. get to everybody here. we got people in the waiting room. Tom, how was 2022 from your perspective? Did you enjoy 2022? Yeah. I mean, because most of the year wasn't actually that crazy. It was just the first three months, right? Where like 2021 was an absolute shit show the entire time. <laughs> so it was actually nice to take some time and not just be busy in the business. You know, what I was thinking about, I was thinking about like, what could I come on here and say that is actually interesting to the viewer? That's not just real estate chatter. Yeah, so please. Yeah, Steve thinks nothing. So I talked with Steve about this and we had heard this, this line. So in 2021, we had a record amount of sales across Canada specifically, you know, Treb had 125,000 sales this year. We're going to end at like 75,000 and everyone was complaining. There's no inventory. There's no inventory, but there was inventory. It was just fast inventory. Mm. And, and if I'm looking at into 2023, I think it's going to be this weird thing where there's still less inventory. Like there's not gonna be a lot to choose from, but it's going to be slow inventory. So I think it's just like, we're still going to have an inventory issue next year, but there's still going to be all those buyers that are like, you know what, I'm still going to wait to see what happens here. But uh, I'm, I'm excited about next year. I think there's going to be a massive opportunity. I bought a property in the last few months because it made sense for me for the long term to jump up the property ladder. But uh, yeah, 2022, I'm happy it's, it's almost done, but uh, it was an interesting year. Interesting year to say the least. And Mr. Patrick Francy, thank you for joining us from where are you right now? Are you in Calgary? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm in Vancouver. Vancouver. Yeah. Oh, so we didn't hit Alberta yet. Do we have anybody coming from there? He's at further west than hey, listen, no, don't, don't forget, don't forget I'm by provincial, buddy. I am so hey, provincial. <laughs> He's representing Alberta today. Representing I can Alberta. I can <clears throat> I qualify to represent Alberta. Oh. I've got businesses there and homes. So Awesome. Pa Patrick, like the investor standpoint, I mean, like investors in 2022, like, whoa, what a story to tell, right? Like, was this a good year for investors? Well, I think it depends on where you entered the game, right? And uh, how you entered the game. You know, there's, you know, there was a lot of emotion driven decisions. And for, you know, those individuals who got caught in the FOMO and the hype, I don't know that it was such a great year. You know, it felt uh -huh. pretty good. And then, you know, reality struck, the music stopped. And uh, when you, when the music stops and you don't have a chair, uh, guess what? You know, it doesn't look so good. Other investors who, you know, stayed on a path and made data-driven decisions and bought for cash flow or had an actual plan uh, with an exit strategy actually did okay. And that wasn't that they were exiting this year or, you know, it was that, that they have a plan and including an exit strategy. So they weren't looking to make a quick dollar, get rich really fast. They weren't taking advice from their brother-in-law or sister-in-law or whatever. And mm -hmm. uh, the next thing you know, that uh, they were doing pretty good. So I think it's a mix. It's a real mix. And uh, we have to understand what's going on economically to actually really see what's going to happen in 2023. And I asked this to another investor we had on the show um, a couple of weeks ago, you know, like, what's the ideal market to be buying in as an investor? I mean, if the prices go up, you know, great, you're going to get that appreciation. Prices are coming down. It's like, well, fantastic. I know I'm not buying near the peak. If prices are flat, I may not get that appreciation. Like ideally, is, is an investor calculating that as, as far as a good market, bad market? You know, there's a, there's some fundamental lessons here for, for everybody that, you know, depends on what your plan is, TK. So, you know, if you're buying for appreciation, just know that that adds a degree of risk because things can happen, right? As we've experienced. And if you're buying for appreciation, that's one strategy. If you're buying for cash flow and a long-term buy and hold, that's a totally different strategy. And of course, then we've got everything in between all of that. So, you know, what's the ideal market? It depends on your strategy. And then I, I think, you know, what I often have taught over the past 20 years is that there is 
no bad real estate market. There really isn't from an investor point of view. What there is, is there's a shift in tactics that has to happen to actually accommodate that strategy or that real estate market. market. So, you know, some markets, you know, buy and hold doesn't make sense right now because you can't get cash flow or it's really hard to get cash flow. So you got to go out hunting, right? You got to go out hunting and look for that motivated, you know, vendor. And then other, other markets, uh, buy and hold makes sense. Cash flow is good today and is only going to get better. So, you know, back to Alberta where we kind of, talked a little bit about, you know, good Alberta, and there's lots of really great things happening there. And economically, it looks very, very strong and has all the reason to continue on that, that path. Well, we know Justice Queen. Hello. Happy New Year. And she she's a big proponent of uh, Alberta, right? Mm -hmm. She's am. from Alberta, I think, right? You're Welcome, from Alberta? Shaisa, ha ha Happy New Year. Happy, happy New Year. New Year. I was born and raised in Alberta and moved here about over 10 years ago. I mean, the thing that I think people do need to keep in mind for Alberta is it is a boom and bust economy. So, I mean, people have to go in understanding that they did have a flat line for a very long time. So are you okay with that? Because it really depends on if you're familiar with the economy, but I mean, the prices of the homes are far more affordable. And I mean, I'm always telling younger people that it, it's a good opportunity to move to if, if you could get like, you know, a career there. Like, I mean, if you're a nurse or you're a teacher, you're kind of like someone that could live anywhere in Canada, why not? Right. Like if you can't afford Toronto, I mean, I never used to kind of have that mentality of telling people to like move there ever before, but lately I'm telling people, cause I actually don't see Toronto prices like going down significantly for people to be able to afford it. Like, I just don't see that happening for the urban center. I, I do see it like probably for the suburbs, but I think Alberta, I mean, in terms of the peace that it provides, the work-life balance, I mean, it's an entirely different world. Like it's like day and night to Toronto. Like I love Alberta um, to death. So <laughs> I'm a big proponent of Alberta. <laughs> so you feel like the the, the living... Um... The quality of life in Toronto is is oh, yeah. decreasing, and that's quality what... of life. I mean, even like I mean, I take public transit. Like I love Toronto as well. Like I mean, I I live in Toronto. I love Toronto, but I can afford to live here. But I mean, I do think from a quality of life perspective, like I mean, even in terms of healthcare, in terms of the transit system, um, like Toronto's had over ten years of austerity. Uh, they have a mayor that isn't really interested in making transit better. Like these are things that we need if, if you know, people are going to say that we're a world-class city and, you know, you're going to market the real estate market as a place where everybody wants to come. You do have to, you know, take care of that kind of stuff, even with the homelessness, like all the different things that are happening in the city. I mean, a lot of people are getting like angry about like how things are in Toronto right now. So I think from a quality of life perspective, if you're looking for peace and quiet, um, a different kind of political outlook, I think that's another reason why people are moving to Alberta. Um, I think that they 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 sort of like maybe like conservative values. Um, so I think that's like another point of view. And I think from a housing perspective, like if you look at Edmonton, the stuff that they've done with zoning, the stuff that they've done with missing middle density, they're like years ahead of uh, Toronto. Like they're years ahead of most places in Canada. Like they're very forward thinking in terms of their housing, in terms of their density, um, all of that stuff. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I like Alberta. I do like Toronto as well, but I think from a quality of life perspective, like I see people over here and it's just normalized to work more than one job. Mm -hmm. Like this is just a normal thing. Like, oh, well, just work another job. Like, I mean, I work to your parents jobs. to co-sign for the mortgage. It's no big deal. Everybody does it. I, like, I always used to say, I always used to say in Canada, like we were so different from the States where, where in the U S they would like kind of migrate wherever the work was or the affordability was right. But like, it didn't matter where they went to school or where their parents were. And they didn't really give a shit about anything, but where they could afford to live. Right. And I, I always noticed that Canadians were nothing like that. Right. Like we always stayed near home and we always wanted to plant the roots kind of close to where we grew up in. And, and, and people are angry that they can't do that right now. But are we seeing kind of a, shift in mentality in Canada now where we're, we're willing to kind of follow the affordability or are people going to start? Well, there's, a, there's a, there's a part of it that, you know, just to speak to it really quickly, which is um, people, the, the work from home opportunity and the work from anywhere opportunity kind of changed the game, right? Uh, that wasn't as, you know, it was always there or it has become more 
like it became more common two, three, even before pre-COVID, right? But now that COVID is here and everybody got to actually practice it, you know, actually go, oh, hold, this does work, this can work. And so the work from home uh, cohort uh, really changed the game in terms of where people can live. It, we saw the dynamics change in terms of the research that we, we do and in regards to housing overall and, of course, from an investor point of view. So that's a, you know, that's a fundamental shift that I don't think is going to go away anytime soon. I think we're still going to have a big portion of our population, working population that is, is wanting to work from home. That, and that changes where they, where they live. What about you, Tom? What do you see? I mean, you're, you're younger than at least me by, by about a decade. What, like, no, but really, I mean, it's a different perspective, right? I'm, I'm slightly biased, right? Like I was born in the city. I've only ever lived in the city, so I can't compare it to anything else. Um, the, I had a friend recently that visited from Calgary and we, out, we went out for lunch and he was like, you know, what is it about Toronto? Cause he had only been here once before. I'm like, well, why are you here? He's like, well, I had to fly here because our company was launch launching on the Toronto Stock Exchange. I'm like, yeah, right. So you flew here. So there was something here that you had to come for, right? So, I mean, if you look at like whether it's like your favorite band, they're going to play here. We have all the sports teams in Canada. The Hockey Hall of Fame is in is in Toronto. You know, Canada's Wonderland is essentially Toronto. It's Vaughn, right? But like it's right there. So all the things are there. But I do totally understand, right? Like if I... The one thing with our jobs as real estate agents is I've kind of built up my business in this city and I could move elsewhere and start from, from the beginning, but it would, it would take some time to build it up again. So I feel like I'm personally a little bit stuck here, not in a bad way, but if I was in a different career and I could move and I could go to Calgary and buy a house and understand that there's going to be some minus 40 days and get over that, I'd think about it. But like in my current situation, I want to be here. Um, so, you know, that's where, where I come from on the topic, but again, I've never lived anywhere else. So I, this is the farthest I've been is wealth for university and then back to the city. Right. So right. it's kind of all I know. Well, there's a the other, another young man who joined the room, Mr. Daniel Foch. Hey, how's it going? Happy new year. Happy new year, buddy. And, and so, so, I mean, you, you kind of, I mean, you, you're kind of known for being working up North, uh, right. Yeah. North ish. And um, I mean, that used to be cheaper, but now it kind of caught up. Um, but we're, what we're kind of talking about at the moment is, is like, are people willing to really move around the country now uh, because of affordability or, or, or uh, as Justice Queen's saying, um, like the, the quality of life here in Toronto is getting worse. Right. Um, Right. So, so are, are there factors at play that are, are forcing people to kind of move around or be more willing to than in the past? Are you seeing that? In yeah, for generation? sure. I think, I think data indicates that people are moving to more affordable locations, but it's how many is the big question, right? Like there's a lot of people moving to Calgary. The, the most people moving out of Ontario are moving to Alberta. Um, and they're in most cases millennials. The millennial cohort is moving to Alberta. Why would they be doing that? Well, probably because they can't economize in a city like Toronto. Everybody's saying Toronto is going to become like New York. It already is like New York in a lot of ways where people basically join this soul sucking economy and get stuck on a hamster wheel for 20 to 30 years. That's fine. Like that's okay. But that's a consequence of being a world-class city. A lot, some people don't want that. And the people who don't want that is probably a minority of the population, but a lot of them are going to places like Alberta. They're going to places like Nova Scotia where they can start a family, have a life. They're not coming back to Toronto. They're planting their roots there. Like this is the, the reason that beer companies market to young people. Cause once they're stuck with that beer or that type of cigarette, they're, they're with them for their whole life. And now a city, you're literally attaching yourself to that geography. So these people are starting families in Halifax or Calgary. They're there forever. That doesn't mean that it's not, it's not bearish for Toronto. Toronto is going to continue immigrating people. It's going to continue to grow as a world-class city. But it's and, and affordability is probably going to continue to erode as a result of that. So, I mean, for people who want quality of life, who want more spending power for their dollar, who want to be able to economize, they're going to other cities where they can do that in Canada. You see the same mobility across the United States for people who want, you know, the sex appeal of the city, you know, to be in, in the city of Toronto, to do the things that Tom was just talking about, to have that central location and be in, in Canada's World Trade Center. Um, they're going to be in Toronto forever. I, the question becomes like who dies with more wealth i'm going to say probably the people who made the financial decision earlier 
just, just so everyone knows, so we got nine people total on on here now. Uh, At any time you have to go, go just go. Yeah, you know, feel you to free to go. We have end. a couple of people still waiting you know, in the way. We want room. to try to get everyone a chance to talk and, and uh, uh, you know plan this property. We, we, it. Greg Ewan's just joined us. I Welcome think they Greg. just kicked me out of happy here. So I'm gonna say happy new year, everybody. Steve um, Karish, thank Steve. you so much, buddy. Happy New Year. Really Steve. appreciate Happy it. New Year, Steve. You bet. Steve, I guys, really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, guys. I'm gonna jump out too. I got I gotta look at that to wake up from a nap. The By Tom the way, story Dan. show bails simultaneously. Dan, you're wearing a hat hey, of a company so... that's still in business. It's amazing <laughs> to see. Yeah, I know. Happy First New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. <laughs> so I, I, there's a comment Ding. I want to make around Alberta that I think is important Thanks, for, for listeners. And that is that, you know, so number one, uh, back to, I think, uh, uh, we talked, somebody mentioned it earlier, which is that, you know, Alberta is an up and down market and it's boom and bust. And these are all things that are attached to Alberta, but understand another fundamental about what drives that, which is what's going on globally. So just keep that one in mind. Number two is that people are moving to Alberta, not just for cost of living, cost of housing, quality of life, et cetera. Businesses are going there as well because of those same reasons. And, you know, plus there's no sales tax, right? There's not an HST, you know, that is a, is attached to Alberta. So that whole cost of living is great. Um, and that makes a really big difference. But one fundamental thing that I'm seeing from an investor point of view, we've, that, which is where we started this conversation from investors, uh, just a little warning, which is uh, we see, I'm seeing a lot of Ontario uh, investors go into Alberta, they're going into Calgary, they're buying condos. And mm. well, that is not necessarily bad. I'm gonna caution everybody, the condo market in Calgary and, Ed and Edmonton specifically, uh, are not what you have in Ontario and in Toronto. Uh, I wouldn't, you couldn't give me a condo. And sadly, I own a half a dozen or more of them, but that was from years ago. And that's why I'm learning. I've, you know, no regrets because, you know, I've owned them for 20 years. They're basically paid for. But I'm saying to investors, do not buy a condo in Edmonton. That's, I, I'll say that with a blanket statement and probably get, you know, beat up for it, but I'm saying that. And in Calgary, be very, very cautious and make sure you're working with a realtor that understands what's going on in those markets because it's just a different game and uh, a lot of money moving into that province. And so just caution. Caution everywhere. I think everywhere you should be using caution right now, but that doesn't mean not to do anything. Uh, Greg, happy new year. Mr. Hey, Jordan Bill. Skrinko is here. Vaz from Vaz City up, Estates is here. Happy New Year, everybody. Merry holidays, whatever the heck you celebrate. I can't. Vaz looks like James Bond right now. Isn't this is amazing. Look at this back. Dude, I, I had some crazy technical issues here, but uh, here we this. are, man. Looks great. Looks yeah. great. Everybody looks great. Jordan Skrinko with the full beard, gruff style. Look at this guy. It's been a it's been a slow December. You don't have to shave when December. you have no clients to see. That's you. right. But he's bearish. He's bullish. What did you? What was your tweet? I'm bullish on Toronto. I'm getting a lot of advertisements for pre-construction, I and mean, the the commission rates keep going up. They keep offering more and more. The the developers. Yeah, I've, heard, I've seen like seven percent. Oh, yeah. we got we we did a we did a few recently at eight. Eight Whoa. percent that you're yeah. never gonna see half of. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> well, I talked to a developer the other day, and they said instead of offering discounts, it's better just to offer the realtors more commission. That's yeah, what... oftentimes the realtors will pass that Basically along in terms of cash thing. back yeah. credit on closing. So it's a, it's another way of getting around it, right? Um, yeah. Oh man, always. Well, at least it's not food, right? That they're not offering realtors bags of food. You know, that's the... sure someone is not yet. <laughs> I'm sure that's it. Realtors right. should be offering bags of food. Like you guys should be standing there in the uh, the open houses, giving out free food. This is uh, this is insane, Mr. Ewans. What's happening from your perspective in planning? Are people still like putting in applications? Are people rushing to get things into the city right now? Yeah, I mean, from what from what we're seeing, um, I, I think it's probably slowed down a bit, but we're we're having a lot of people talk to us about stuff outside Toronto. We got a few projects in Toronto that we're working on, stuff that we've got lined up to start in January. Um, but yeah, it's and, and a bunch of missing middle stuff, believe it or not. Um, a lot of people that are taking existing properties, adding garden suites, laneway suites, chopping them up into triplexes, sixplexes, other stuff. And so we got a bunch of that. Um, I don't know. I think it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens next year. The province is going to come out with more legislation, I suspect, early in the new year to shake things up. Um, and yeah, I, I think 
you know, housing is still going to be the issue. As I was jumping on the call, by the way, this is like the biggest New Year's party I'm going to be at this year. So, <laughs> me too. Me too. I got my like, seven month old over there. Uh, yeah. Right. So, no, I think somebody was saying when I hopped on that housing and inflation is still going to be the thing next year. I think I think people are going to talk about housing just as much, but more so in the context of the overall cost of living being an issue next year. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be the big deal. But uh, and so what you're saying yeah. is creating more density and stuff like that. That's not going anywhere. Anytime well, soon. yeah, I hope. I mean, this, this, like, I mean, build more housing. Like, the, it, it, I don't know. It takes some real mental gymnastics to get from the problem of there are more people than ho or there are more people than homes, and then the solution of let's make sure that the industry earns only as much as uh, a few politicians might be personally comfortable with. Like, I, I just, I mean, Toronto especially has to take its official plan. You know, where we grow, where we don't grow, and really, I mean, almost blow it up. We, we need more areas where there's a lot more density, create more centers, create more areas where you can build more density, get away from tall and sprawl. Um, I don't know. I've talked to you guys. Both do, do, do you feel, before. do you feel good saying that now that you're not working at the city anymore? It's kind of like on the I, record, I I like, said, here you go, blow it up. <laughs> I, I think most people in the city actually agree with that point of view. So it's, uh, I mean, the plan is like 20 years old, more than that. Cause a bunch of stuff was carried over from the pre 2000 plan. And honestly, it should have been rewritten in 2010. It wasn't it wasn't suited to handle the growth of the past 10 years in Toronto. It's been crammed all into specific areas and look at the effects of it. Look at it like there's no easy sites left. It's very challenging to build. So hopefully there's some relief on that front, whether it's at the city level or the province or, or whatever else. So, yeah. And I hope last thing I'll say is I hope that we stop asking people um, so much about what kind of housing they're they think should be built in their communities. Right. I think. We go out and we have these consultation meetings about, oh, do you want a four-story or six-story apartment over here? Do you want this? Do you want that? We got to start treating housing like infrastructure, where there's a demonstrated need in an area. Go out and figure out how to get it built. Yeah. So. We're tearing up my front lawn right now in December. It's almost January. And it says it's not going to be done till May. We got no options, no choice. Right? right? That's it. Uh, Jordan, uh, projects that are getting launched. I mean, you're hearing it from Greg himself. We need more housing. What do you yeah. see for 2023? Are we going to have more housing created from from developers uh well i think i think uh the the problem is just going to be investor appetite you got to hit those sales targets in order to get the construction financing and depending on what type of product you're launching and where people are just sitting back and waiting right it's very hard to swallow you know when everything's going up and everybody's making a ton of money you know it's very easy to look at a project that's 30 percent over market value over resale market value value um, and say oh whatever i'll still make money on it 10 years down the line but when when the market's headed sideways or worse down, it's very difficult to swallow a premium like that. And the problem is the cost of construction has risen so much over the last two years, but the price of the actual resale market value of condos has not. Therefore, the gap is at levels we've never seen before, right? So you're paying in some projects 1800 a foot for a one bedroom where the resale market across the street is at 1200 a foot. So how do you swallow that? And as an investor, and what I'm telling my investors is you don't, <laughs> you don't. Do you, you don't. Yeah. Um, and so you have to look for other projects where a lot of the times, you know, projects that launched two, three years ago, unfortunately, they're closing sooner, but they have far better pricing because they're already mid construction. Some of these projects are priced at resale market value. But the reality is, and this is something, you know, on Twitter, I get a lot of heat for this. So like, why would anybody pay these premiums? Here's the reality. And here's how consumer sentiment works. 20% of the population is C-type analytical people who are going to put rational thinking above all else. The rest of them are not. And so what happens is people tell you, clients tell us all the time, over thousands of sales, clients will tell us price is their primary consideration when they're considering a pre-construction condo. They're full of shit. They just don't know it. What what actually is their primary consideration is something else entirely. And what I mean by that is if you have project A, which is priced at resale market value, but launched a year ago, okay, and project B, which is launching today, which is 25% more than resale market value, but has thousands of worksheets. So it's oversubscribed. It's what everybody else wants. It's the shiny object with all the buzz and hype. Everybody thinks they want project A, right? But when you give them, when you when you present that opportunity to them, it's objection after objection after objection. But when instead you get them a unit that's 25% above resale market value at project B, and you tell them there's 10 other people in line for this unit, if you don't want it, you have 24 hours to sign it, they'll sign it and they'll thank you. And you know they're super happy about that purchase. So the reality yeah. is it's a lot easier to sell a project based on hype than it is based on numbers. And that's the unfortunate reality in Toronto. So when that hype is gone and projects are not oversubscribing, it's a real grind to hit that 70% sales target. You're not, you're not selling out over a weekend anymore. 
Um, so, I mean, a long answer to your question, but uh, I think this is why I said I'm bullish, right? Um, is because at the same time as all-time high immigration, it's very hard for developers to pre-sell enough inventory to break ground right now. So you're actually going to see a contraction in housing starts versus what you would normally see. Sure. So and what, that's what, my what bull case. And but what happens to like inventory and pricing when guys start defaulting on their loans and can't get the construction financing that they I mean they've sold the project but things start to fall apart or they've started construction and things start to fall apart? Like and, and then like well, what happens then? Because that's like hundreds of units that people thought that they were moving into on mm -hmm. X date that now all of a sudden they need to find somewhere else to live probably, right? So Yeah, so I mean, for for some people, I would almost say the project canceling and their re deposits being refunded is probably what they're hoping for. A right good now. thing right now, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, but but yeah, no, you're going to get more But they still need to live somewhere. Yeah. Right. And so then they, they, have a, they have to wait another year or two, right? So, Daryl, to uh, Jordan's point there, uh, in concern to, you know, the cost of construction and taking us back to to 1980, you know, people had paid uh, good bucks for land. All right. That was one of the big issues. Inflation was high. Land values were high. And what happened is these these started to fail. So when when the, the land came back on the market, it came in at at a rate that was that you know the banks the lenders are the ones that took the hit on it so the, the land got repriced came back out into uh, into a value that was uh, that was attainable that was that could be absorbed into the market so i've been saying for a long time especially you know to my investors you know one of the biggest things that will kill you is overpaying for land right mm -hmm. you, you can't get into there and you have to do everything and, and weigh, weigh all of the uh, pluses and minuses because overpaying for raw land will kill you for your investment. It could kill you for your investment uh, uh, options down the road. So have a lot of developers, Daryl, overpaid for their land recently? Because they're basing all those performers on in the last the two years. Price, price, price. Like, yeah, like I can't imagine how they haven't, but I mean, it really depends on where they bought and how they bought and what kind of financing they got. From also, the what density vendor. assumptions? Too. Yeah, like, density assumptions. There's so many things. I think there's a there's a fundamental. You know, Jordan brought it up you know, a little bit. You know, just around the twenty percent who actually look at things. You know, if we've learned nothing over the past couple of years, is that you know, critical thinking is not as common. Like when you look at this group. <laughs> We're all critical thinkers, and what we uh, uh, probably have been observing and being frustrated by is that that isn't really common. So for realtors, especially, you know, you guys often get a bad rap because you're selling deals that you shouldn't be selling, quote unquote. But the reality of it is, nobody knows the conversations and the guidance that you've tried to to provide a lot of buyers and not doing that or doing that or considering this or considering that and they make their decisions the way they make their decisions often emotional you know maybe fomo especially the past uh, year you know there's a lot of that involved and so when we look at what's happening in the market you know understand you guys are in the business you know i've been in the business for 20 years over 20 years and and you start to understand how much and how many dynamics there are to try to come up with a, a future picture, you know? So imagine you guys are in the industry, you're in it every single day in the trenches and you're even having like, how do we connect all these dots to make sense out of it? Sure. You know, Don is going back to 1980. I go back to 1977 when I bought my first piece of real estate. So, you know, these are things that are really complex and I, you know, I don't know that there's a, a real answer other than to continue to look at what the economic fundamentals are. We've got geopolitical issues. And then you're talking specifically about, let's say, Toronto slash GTA, you know, Southern Ontario, whatever you want to look at. And it is really complex. And, uh, you know, I think it's up to us as leaders to do our best to give people, you know, options. And they're going to make the choices they make, understanding one fundamental, that critical thinking is not all that common. So, you yeah. know. Well, I, I think from a development standpoint, I mean, find me someone who didn't think they overpaid when they bought it. And and I mean, with a long enough time horizon, most developers end up looking like geniuses. But now's a dangerous time, right? Like where this is not the same. I 
a couple of you on the panel may have been through this inflation thing. I was alive during it, but certainly not coming from a perspective of, you know, needing to understand it or, or knowing what was going on around me. I was like 11 or something like that, 12. But now, like I've been through a crash and I got destroyed. I think everybody on the panel knows that that's kind of part of my story. I got killed in 2009 because I was overzealous and stupid. Uh, and, and I saw warning signs and people told me and I didn't listen. I thought I was smarter and, and, and I learned my lesson the hard way. But like now is this feels totally different to me. This doesn't feel like 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. This feels like, like nobody has control <laughs> of anything right now. And things are just kind of like floating out there and you got a bunch of idiots trying to figure out what to do. And like, like, honestly, Who's telling people to buy $2 million houses on an Uber driver's salary? Like, what the hell's going on? And, and, and like, like, who is telling people to buy these condos where you're going to be under every single month? Right? Like, those mm -hmm. performers I've seen. And, like, who? We had, we had Santo on at the beginning Darryl, of the call. Just a, question, just a question for all of you, because I've seen a lot of that kind of banter on Twitter. But do you think that those are the outliers? That's is that the norm? Is that I think really, it's the you know, norm around here. That's the yeah. thing, and that's why things are so fucked. Isn't that the norm, Dan? Like <laughs> you look at stuff with some crazy yields, but like most yeah. people look at them and go, "What the fuck is that stuff?" It's like, yeah, yeah. I think um, people in the GTA were comfortable buying cash negative for the past uh, twenty years because appreciation always made the deal make sense right i mean it's classic u.s setup for, it was a performa uh, line like it was a line on the performa like it will go yeah, it up will... by this much right. this many times this many years like it was just yeah, jump in were, yeah, yeah jump in everybody like terminal terminal value and and it always made sense you take out the terminal value if you assume a no appreciation environment the deal never made sense and never. that to me isn't an investment it's speculation right and that and that's just fine like, that's, it was that's this, cool but it was now this you sentiment yeah, this sentiment is what drove it. So uh, Patrick's question was, is this, you know, the, the minority? No, it's actually the majority of investors, right, in the, in the GTA. So because they all feel the same way, they're all sort of ringing their own truth by driving the prices up. You know, I made money, you make money, I made money, you make money, we all make money. Oh, and, and so e it's driven by this sort of unnatural um, demand that, you know, everyone's just kind of like, I'm not sure what I'm doing, but I know if I keep doing it and telling everyone else, it's great. So why we've lost... 30 something percent of the volume this year, right? As some of the numbers you've heard from 125,000 to 75,000, whatever sales are down big time is because that little unquantifiable measure, that sentiment that buyers had has disappeared. It's gone. What the was fear Jordan of missing out say? is no is, longer there. Well, I was just going to say, is it unnatural or is it, the, is it the normal process as a major metro matures as a housing market? Like, hmm. did we not yeah, see I, this happen in New York, Hong Kong, well, London, city. Berlin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you look at like UBS, you know, real estate bubble index literally just reads as a list of cities that are, you know, places that people want to live, right? Like they're the most, most uh, sought after places to live in the world. It sucks. Like it, it, but this is the reality that Canada is facing. And and my, I've said this for, for years before COVID happened, before emergency interest rates, the end of what this looks like for Canada is we fail, or, or at least for Toronto and Vancouver is we, we, finish our life cycle as a, a city that ends up as a renter's economy. Like right. most world-class cities are in that position. And so if you want to capitalize on that, you need to be somebody who's a provider of housing. And because, you know, you look at most of Germany, high institutional ownership of housing in urban areas, low home ownership rates, Switzerland, some of the lowest home ownership rates in the world. These are all economies that Canada aspires to be like, right? They're just much older countries than we are. And so they're further along in their, in their cycle. So, Think about other OECD nations that, you know, 100 years ago, people, everybody in the world wanted to move to Europe, right, as an example. And now what have they ended up like? Canada is in the same position. The U.S. was in this position maybe 20 or 30 years ago or 50 years ago, let's say. And in a lot of cases, they're very much a renter's economy, right? So we're just much earlier in that trajectory. Like the end is visible here. It's just most people aren't thinking about it that way. Most people are thinking prices go up and it's this home ownership Ponzi scheme. But the reality is you can find good assets to rent to people and create housing. That's where the money is going to be made long term. That's where it's going to be made. Vaz, long, long what do you have to say? They have a plan in place, right? Which is, you know, the type of people that Patrick at Rain and, yeah. and, you know, the people who are actually educated on it. But the people who are just jumping in, assuming prices will go up, 
don't have an exit strategy, don't understand how the market works, don't uh, don't know have any other plan other than one day I'm going to sell it for more money and speculating. That it's, to me is not sustainable or natural. That's something that you know will come and go and disappear. And I, I feel like it's gone. It has to. Well, the, I, the part I, that's sorry, yeah, the part that's the most funny, sorry, Dale, is is that no like good assets, good performing assets will appreciate in value too. Like the cap rate compression that we were seeing in some of the cities, like Cornwall as an example, which is one that I talked about, we were going from like during COVID, it was trading in like the four cap area and we were buying pre COVID in, in six, seven, and we're buying a 7% caps again. I could have doubled my money and sold some of those assets during COVID if I wanted to, like they appreciated just as much, if not more than a lot of these other, uh, other you know speculative assets that people were buying in in certain areas so you might you can buy for yield and still get the capital appreciation like it doesn't they're not mutually exclusive there's you know there's the one piece but but most people are thinking only capital appreciation when you can get both right that, that speaks to what we talked about earlier which is what is your plan right most people don't have one but I, you know back to you know daryl what you said earlier is that it seems so different than it was back in 08, 09 during the, you know, the GFC. And, and the reality of it is, is that we've never ever experienced where we're having a global, uh, I'm going to call it over liquidity crisis, you know, all central banks started, you know, just absolutely flooding the world with capital. That was the first issue. You've got Ukraine and uh, Russia going on. You've got China, Taiwan. You've got UK and uh, Europe melting down. You've got China doing oil deals uh, with OPEC. I mean, there's so many uh, so macro geopolitical shit. issues it's crazy. that we 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 don't we have no idea what's really going on. Yeah. So you know, it's like everybody's waiting for inflation to come down. And because I study it, I'm going hold on to your hats because the fundamental issue we're going to have is interest rates number one don't change the price of oil they don't change the price of fuel and they do not change the price of food, food. and we've got a fundamental that right now oil's not so bad my you know i'm looking at it right now i'm going i it's only going up oh, and yeah. when we start to see oil go up everything else will in fact uh, go up so what we can do what you know canada is a debt driven economy and a housing driven economy will feel the pain uh, in the housing market for sure. But, you know, there's going to be a lot more of the unknowns because of the global macro. For sure. Faz is an accountant, so he must have been going crazy as people are looking at these performers. <laughs> and, you know, what do you have to say about last year and the, the last little while? So I, I have I have a friend that was selling a condo and he put in a, a 7 percent appreciation. And he told me that's conservative. And he was trying to tell it, tell me that this is a good move. And this is back in 20, tail end of 2021. Oh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> wild, right? But I did want to make a comment. So I had Mark Morris on my YouTube channel. And as you guys know, this guy puts out pure fire. When he talks, people listen. Yeah. And I had about a handful of people reach out from that video that bought pre-cons. And it was about power of sale, the process, how it works, what to do. And... I think the lowest exposure that somebody had on pre-cons from the three or four people that reached out was $2 million. So this guy was the best case. His salary, so a single earner with his wife, salary of 125 grand a year. Oh my God. His exposure to pre-cons was 2 million. Oh. The best one I had, he was at, I think, three and a half mil, but his household income was about half a million between him and his wife. So anyway, I refer these people to Mark. I don't know what's going to happen. I will reach out to them. I have them in my follow-up but yeah man pretty wild selection One, bias though yeah if they reach out to you from a video including mark morris talking about pain in the <laughs> yeah. assignment market they're going to be the absolute the most worst painful yeah. like yeah. you know like, like the people who call me in tears asking me to sell their assignment units are the are the same people they're the ones with like four pre-con contracts all closing at the same time in the same building and i'm like what's your household income they're like 150k and i'm like who mm -hmm. got you into this from fucking mess like this is what's you know, going on the, the, the one that, but I is, think that there's so there's a scarier cohort of people who haven't even started thinking about it yet, Jordan. Like people who are like, oh yeah, whatever, I'll fucking figure it out. When yeah, I'm it's next year. Who cares? Yeah, yeah, like oh, I don't have to solve this problem for two years. Like <laughs> those are the ones that worry me more. To be honest, it's just, you know, like you know who's actually is good. The thing that doesn't, the thing that kind of keeps me sane is, is and, and keeps me sleeping sound at night is that like we have thousands of unit sales on my team and like the vast vast majority are just mom and pops with one or two investment properties and good household income and usually they're like they're spread across time so like one of their investments will be like 
five five to ten years ago it's cash flowing it's not a concern so it's just like i i don't see a lot of like these 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 lunatics who have bought five and and only have 100k household Lunatic. income there but may well, be you know more what? of them here's... than i'm aware of i have no idea but they're the only ones that seem to call me so <laughs> here's the difference though here's the difference it, they're not condos a lot of these guys that they're totally screwed the, the ones that bought freeholds so in mm -hmm. Richmond Hill for 2.2. So now Richmond Hill is a little bit of a different story, but these are the guys because the freeholds are getting done much faster. They have to close on them in the next Sooner. six to eight months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So those are the guys that are in trouble. The condo ones, they're praying for delays, which they're going to get and all that stuff. But, oh, yeah, they'll get them. But I think the more important question is, and I want to just pivot a little bit here, is Dan had a space on Thursday. And the, the, my one takeaway from that space, there was a lot of conviction at least from some people, or at least it just kind of, it was said and then it nobody really challenged it. So I just want to know from the group here, um, it seems reasonable to think that we could be going to 2016 prices. So that means another 25 to 30% down from where we are right now. So I just want to get everybody's thoughts on that because to me, that's interesting. Nobody challenged it. I'm just kind of curious. Well, we've got Nolan Mathias here, one of the top subscribe to youtubers in canada welcome sir How, great time for 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 you to join how are you hey Happy thanks for here. having me thought he was wearing a beretta hat for a second there a beretta hat what that's is that an alberta joke no it's but it, <laughs> no no it just looked like the logo when it was the thumbnail i had to blow it up i was excited i got uh what did i get recently canadian girl guides they thought i was trying to hot girl guide cookies <laughs> <laughs> the black clover hat uh, yeah that's the a, they're doing influencer deals now i heard the bro guides the girl yeah guides. totally <laughs> that are you guys funny. all doing it sounds like i got here just at like the most interesting time pre-construction and inflation and I think price uh, forecasting. Price forecasting. I, I'll answer. I'll answer Vass's question. I, I think it would be. I think in certain areas it wouldn't be unheard of to see drops of that size. Like, what's that peak to drop forty percent, ish? I think well, it's more. It's got to be more. Yeah. In certain areas, yeah. I, I mean, look at what happened in twenty seventeen. Like, the market is not. It, it's able to shed thirty to forty percent very quickly, and we just did it again. Like. I think that the next question becomes how long do we stay at 30% reduction in buying power, right? Or borrowing power. And if we stay there for a year, then prices are going to continue to grind down because there's nobody to buy them. Hmm. I I agree. I, I agree with you. You know, the, the only thing, like every time I've put sense into these assumptions, I get slapped in the face, just like just betting against Toronto. That's why like mentally my brain is telling me, yeah, I've got, of course we're going to grind down. But then I still feel there's buyers on the sidelines. I feel that the delta between getting a deal done right now is about five points, maybe 10. If somebody has a house listed for a million bucks and that's market and that's fair market based on most recent comps, there are a ton of buyers ready to close on it at 950. But they just want to front run a discount. At least that's how I feel based on my small sample size. So people are willing to, to, to go for it. It's just they just need to front, front run a discount. But 2016 prices, I, I guess... I'm not a bull or a bear. I'm just whatever, you know, I'm just trying to use logic here. And it's a little bit scary. And just the one anecdote I'll use being in Markham in 2017, when we had a run up, one of a house down the street from me, a little bungalow, single car garage sold for 1.35 at the absolute peak in 2017. And then the same house two, three years later was 950. And now right now, the same house was is 1.4, 1.3. So we're back at it. I can see the grind down there. Or at least in at least in these specific situations. But overall, to go back to 2016, I don't know. I I need somebody to kind of walk it, me the, the well. The it map. doesn't take much. So so here, first of all, let's okay. The the Bank of Canada, Federal Reserve, their their job right now. They put it out there. They have to kill jobs. Like they want to destroy the job market. Right. We haven't even seen that yet. Unemployment's so low. It's crazy. Yeah. It doesn't take much to reset the value of a street, okay? It takes one sale for the comp to now be, holy shit, the last one, everything was selling at $2 million. The last one just sold at one five. They were desperate. So what does this mean now? Okay, we can ignore it, but what about the next one that sells really low? Or what about this area where all these people bought like they were so stupid and the, the whole area gets disintegrated? Like These are things you're going to see developers that are building custom homes that get smoked. They were supposed to sell it for 3.2 and they can't even get $2 million for it. Like These are things that I think 
they have an effect on on the local kind of area. Maybe I'm wrong. I was that I, guy in 2000. So, and yeah, somebody else jump in. Yeah, yeah, I, just, I would jump in real quick because I got to take off in a sec. But uh, all you you all have much better sense of where prices are going because you're at sort of that point in the process. I'm more at the the start of the stream when people are getting their entitlements, they're doing the rezoning and stuff. And all I'll say is in in Toronto and the GTA. People are still actively looking to rezone, uh, get additional density on properties. And that's, I think, where a lot of landowners might be looking in the next year. Whether they build or not, as soon as they can, that remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't have a sense of that. But for now, you know, people are interested in upzoning, getting their entitlements, and then seeing where they go from there. But anyway, man, thanks for having me. It was nice thanks, to see you. Thanks, I hope everybody has a great new year. year. Happy New Year. Happy thanks, thanks, Greg. Happy New Year. I'm going to send you an email. I want to have a chat next week with you. I got Sounds a property in Scarborough. Soon. Okay. Nice. Thanks, Chris. So, I might um I might quickly jump in on uh, on Bass's example there. I don't um like I guess the question is were are the the buyer that you're referring to are they willing to pay nine fifty like are they a price floor or are they willing to pay ninety five percent of asking price because I think that like it, it's very easy to see how a race to the bottom happens when now all of a sudden that seller is willing to accept nine fifty publicly on their listing price and now your buyer is actually willing you know it turns out they're actually willing to pay 900 right well i think that's the standoff we have like deals are not closing because of this little delta and these are mostly end users like there's no investors right now at least as far as i see on the residential side trying to buy anything but let's say you're a capitalized good family you're looking to buy a detached in one for 1.4 you're going to pay 1.35 for it, but the seller is not willing to give it because they have the comps to say that it is 1.4 all day long based now, yeah. on everybody else. So everybody, it's just a standoff for now. For now. And I think that, you know, like that's your bid ask table. If you're to examine it like a stock market, right? Like you're, you're you know, yeah. in, in February, like we, we bounced down from 120% of asking price in February to 98% of asking price. And then we kind of like have been between 98 and hundred percent of asking price on Treb. So you're at a point where the market, it's, we know that the market is demanding that houses sell for less than asking price. Don't put price completely aside. So we, I think that the bid is right now is below what the asking price is and sellers are refusing to price discover. Buyers can price discover very easily. They don't have to do anything. All they have to do is be willing to pay less money. Sellers have to go and get a price oh, reduction. They have to have a painful conversation with their realtor. They have to you know, debate about it. They take their house off the market, whatever it is. And so the price discovery, we're at the point where this is where, like when I talk about it being a grind down, it takes a lot longer for prices to continue following from here because sellers are the ones who are trying to hang on to that price control, even though we're in a buyer's market where buyers do dictate prices. What are we seeing for mortgage originations and refinancing and applications from your end, Noah? Yeah, I mean, I, end of one on this, but our, our applications between Christmas and New Year's were as high as they were last year, which is, I mean, that uh -huh. could be Alberta, that could be nationwide. I didn't look at where they were coming from, but it seems like it seems like there's still buyers and there's always stage of life people that are going to be purchasing anyways in some way, shape or form. Um, so you have to you have to consider that like there's the people that are going to have the babies like uh, Tom Story that are going to want a bigger house. There's the people that are going to be downsizing. There's always going to be people moving. It's just a question of how much. And I think we used a lot of the uh, a lot of the the activity from the future and moved it into 2021 and 2022. But that doesn't mean that there will be zero activity to answer that question about with respect to housing prices um, and, and a 40 percent peak to trough. You have to remember that we have a 20 percent headwind just on qualifying rate alone so the stress test and then we've got a 40 percent headwind on uh, on the actual interest rates themselves so if nothing else changed then yeah you should you should expect just from a all else being equal a 40 percent reduction in in housing prices just on the interest rates alone yeah. now of course that's only looking at interest rates if you look at incomes if you look at inflation if you look at all the other things in in the economy, there's going to be multipliers in both directions. And then the question is, how much are the multipliers in both directions? And and do we end up being worse off than that? Or do we end up being slightly better than that? But I think, you know, there's, there's, I think you can be pretty sure that we're going to see a little bit more housing price reduction from where we're at right now. It's going to go down at least some more from where, where right now is. I think there's let's, a, a uh, couple let's... things just a couple of things to always keep in mind back to Vassal's comment is it's, it's a very regional market, mm -hmm. you know, like we have to look at real right. estate so regionally and we get too caught up in looking at national numbers and averages and wage averages and pro you know, we got to get really focused. So 
you know, Nolan knows Alberta, you know, like I know Alberta. And, and so when we look at the Western provinces, and I'm talking Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, and I know Manitoba and Saskatchewan, low population, so they don't ever seem to work into the calculation. But I'm, I'm looking at it from an investor point of view, saying that, number one, what drives an economy is jobs. And all three of those provinces have a, a lot of jobs driven by oil, agriculture, fertilizer, commodities, like, so those are healthy very healthy economies. And so although we may see, you know, some flatlining, it goes back to what's your strategy, you can still buy for cash flow in Alberta. It, it, and, and then there's probably not any, I, what I call major city, you know, you look at Edmonton, Calgary, I'd avoid like, personally, I'd avoid a Grand Prairie, for example, but I'd be very interested in a Lethbridge or a, you know, even a medicine hat because jobs and jobs is what drives that population growth that inter that interprovincial migration and migration we've got ukraine refugees coming in and they're pouring in primarily to alberta because that's where their culture lives and saskatchewan and so those are all things that are going to continue to drive the demand for housing and as long as people are working you're good now i'm going to say one other thing and this goes back to the unemployment low unemployment and the bank of canada want to bring bring it up this unemployment is not healthy. Full stop. I agree with Tip Macklem. We need to bring it up. Like I say, I've been in business 40 years. I've been through the Alberta. I've been through so many cycles and this is not healthy. It's not healthy for employers and it's not healthy for employees. Not knowing who's going to show up at the job, being short staffed, working over, all those things are not healthy. What we're going to see is a lot of headlines and we can only hope, and this is me personally, I only because I've got other businesses, I only hope that unemployment goes to about 6%. It's so healthy. It's such a great market. People come, they go, you're not being held hostage as an employer. Employees feel like they could go out and find a better job if they're looking, but they're not being drawn for, you know, a, a buck an hour kind of thing. So these are all things that when we look at what's happening economically, we have to consider how it impacts housing. And so regionally, I think Western provinces are going to do quite well. I think Ontario is going to struggle back and forth and having all these questions that you guys are asking because it is that uncertain and it's our major city. So them in Vancouver, of course. So a little bit longer. I think it, a big, a the employment years. piece too is just trying to avoid a wage price spiral, right? Because you can't take that out of, that's the type of inflation that you can't take out of the economy. <laughs> 100%, Dan, that's so true. Yeah. That's why they have to kill it. So speaking, you said you mentioned the word strategy. And so I I, I want to turn to Mr. Jeremiah Shamus here. Happy New Year, sir. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome, joined, welcome. If you I don't know if you when you see this, you guys may not see it, but we have like a row of people with no beards. Donna, you're one of them. And then everybody else has a beard underneath us. So it, welcome to the beard level. Uh, oh, thank you. What what what? what he, Patrick mentioned strategy and, and like, do you notice in the development space, are any developers, land developers thinking different strategies right now? Are they looking at different products than they would have looked at over the last few years? Uh, <clears throat> no, not really. It's more so just how they're structuring deals. Like everything's changed in terms of buying, but the product type hasn't changed. I mean, you just have a few specialized buyers who are doing, you know, specifically different types of products like, you know, North Drive, which is doing high luxury stuff and they're still launching. But other than that, it hasn't really changed on the strategy side. It's more so the buying, the structuring of the deals because everyone right now believes, I mean, like everyone, we're going to be in a world of pain for two years. And so everyone's buying unzoned land and no one wants to launch next year. So I think you're going to have record low right. launches next year. <clears throat> so people are still buying though, is what you're saying? Yeah. And so what, what are the prices yeah, doing on the buy and on land right now? Are they stable? Are it's, they dropping? It's all structured deals. I mean, like we just closed two deals the end of this year, one to a private, um, not from Canada, but living in Canada type developer investor and then another institution a name you guys would recognize and they both are structuring basically the same type of deal so one was a very large vtb um, a first and a second structured different timing different rates oh. and the, the other one was uh they had locked in some some rates quite a bit of time ago i guess you could say and they were originally, I think it was bankers acceptance, 200 plus 240 basis points. So, you know, like it, 
and there was like a year closing on after they waived their condition. So that's not typical. What you're seeing typically now is, and I always joke because I had my team, I made hats for my team that says, make the seller financing great again, make seller financing great again, because it's all we deal with. Yeah. It's uh, it's like, there's no, no one wants to do debt anymore. And if you are doing debt, it's at 55% loan to value on the land value that is very, very reasonable and no future value as your tweet mentioned a little while ago, Daryl. So right now, everyone's looking for structure and the best developer- trans Translate that. Translate that okay. to the price is, is, is not- Well, what that's what I'm saying is for, aren't all of these- Based on these other VTB deals. It, but all of this is just to hold the price. No, at a, at a, at a well, not really. Value. No prices, you know, prices come down 20%. They have like everywhere, everywhere. Land prices come down 20%. In fact, I'm working on a, like what I would call like one of the largest deals in the downtown core right now. And, you know, the price will hold uh, probably even differently. So like there's, there are a lot of pricing changes happening right now. The floor is being set differently. And for anyone who wants to keep their price high, they're doing very high leverage. Like <laughs> I had a vendor tell me he'd do 100% BTB. Right. Like 100% seller financing. Right. To keep the price. price, right? Yeah. Fucking so, a. Like, <laughs> crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then we just put another one under contract, 75% uh, vendor financing. And you don't see a lot of that ever because similar to the employment sector you have not had leverage as a buyer now as a buyer you have leverage in your negotiation so similar to um i'm not sure who it was but was mentioning they think the the employment the employment world is going to move back towards the employer having a bit of leverage that's what's happened in the land market it's what's happened in the industrial building sales um same with apartment building sales same thing like I'll give you an example. Last year in Q, Q4 of 2021, there was 70 apartment sales. This year, there was 15. So, wow. <laughs> so like, how many units like, total, do you know? Like this is anything that is uh, th five units and up. Hmm. So, so yeah, I, I just, I've, I just I've sold a, a six sale. unit building on transit and we were actually pretty reasonable on price. You know, we were asking 300 a door um, in last year's market. You could ask 400 a door. So the market has come down substantially. And because of that, no one's That's willing big. to sell. Right. So you have a, effectively the volume of apartment building sales dropped about 90% over the last two quarters. And so it's the, I always say it's the most sensitive asset class to interest rates because the spread between the bond or the debt rather and you're going in cap rate, you're going in yield is, is the tightest of any asset class. So yeah. that's a really good understanding of how you see the market has changed on pricing. Because like you said, Daryl, like people aren't willing to drop their price. And the same thing ha happened on industrial properties. The only difference with industrial buildings is that sub 30,000 square feet space is uh, um, users. So you still have users who are looking for utility. I mean, similar to what you're dealing with in the residential home space, if someone has to buy a house and they need to live there and they're just going to buy it no matter what, and they can't, they can't rent something what they're looking for, they're still going to buy. Right. So if that happens in the commercial space when for utility, and that's basically mostly office buildings and industrial buildings. Um, the, but the, six, the 60 unit Jeremiah. So were they not willing to do any favorable terms? Like were they not no. willing or able? they weren't able to because it was an estate situation. So they had to sell it off, but you know, it was a beautiful building. It was taken well taken care of. And they just said, you know, what is our price today? And so we went out with a very high asking price. Um, and we said, we encouraged everyone to just bring us offers. And we did this as a strategy to say, like I told the vendor, I said, listen, we don't really know what it's worth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we can guess, and, you know, luckily we guessed um, around 285 a door and we ended up selling it for 305 a door. So, you know, we hit above our expectations, but the only reason we hit above our expectations is because this was, you know, best in class building, very, you know, well taken care of. These type of buildings didn't come up very often. So you still had 
what I call generational money looking to invest into it, but it's still to make sense, right? Have to so have a you, lot of cash, no? A lot of cash? Yeah, it would be an all cash buy, even though right. eventually they put debt on it. So would you nail yeah, down a gonna... cap rate right now, like AAA location in Toronto on a, a multifamily? Would you say if cap rates are six, seven percent? Would you be able to quantify no, that? No, they're, I no mean, way. they're still they're 2%. still like four percent. <laughs> okay. They're four percent. Triple A location, four percent. Triple A is four percent. Huh? Yeah. And that's again, it's again. <laughs> I know it doesn't really make sense, but if you look in the previous market, the caps were two and a half, two, seven, five. Yeah. Right. So are we leading towards a different market? I'm not sure. Like I, I always like to use Manhattan as a very similar market to ours, just because Manhattan from 1904 to 1978, it had very similar immigration policies. So 1904 to 1978, you had on average 70,000 people moving to the city per year. And then in Toronto, you know, we have conversely about 100,000 per se. And so Manhattan had a market where, you know, there's a lot of housing need. There was a lot of commercial need. It had a market where a lot of investment sales, like commercial building sales and land kind of drove the market. So in the same way, Manhattan had cap rates at around two to 3%. And when they had some changes in their market, their market is now at like five to six caps. For apartment buildings I they're mean, a disaster now though aren't they it's a disaster yeah and it yeah. has it does have a lot to do with the policy for um uh, rent control there it's gone extremely liberal uh they protect uh, the unit whereas we protect um or sorry they protect the renter we protect the unit i guess it is um and so they've had a, a substantial change in value in their apartment buildings so um you know, the caps have gotten quite a bit higher, but the per unit numbers are still low or still high. So in the same way, will Toronto's market move like that? I'm not sure. You know, there's just not, a, you see it in the volume now, you know, we had 15 apartment building sales in the last quarter, you know, com conversely to 10, 70 in 2021. And 2021 was the highest year we had for apartment building sales on record. It was uh, almost 3 billion and 200 transactions. So um, will that change? Yeah, I think, I think it'll change substantially, but the volume has been sucked out. So there's, there's a lot less buyers in that market. There's a lot less people who actually want to do anything. Welcome to 2023. 2023 <laughs> looks like, exactly. the show. so, so, I mean, we can't get a better brain trust than we've had on the show today, TK, can we? I mean, I, I, I don't know. Do you have a, like a, something up your sleeve? Is there? Well, I'm just saying, I mean, <laughs> I don't feel I we like I'm, well, I think we definitely nailed it, but I don't feel like anybody knows what's going to happen next year. I mean, I think everybody's just kind of bracing for impact, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's like, we it's don't, but, 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 it's stupid to make predictions because we've all like, is there anyone here who's over the age of 50? Like, sorry, I don't, you don't have to answer that, but no, like I, not anymore. God, no, no, not anymore. Exactly. So I just say like, we've never been through a market cycle like this. We don't know what's going to happen. Nothing All like the old guys that I'm talking to old guys and girls, they're scared. You know, they're telling me that, that like the volume's going to drop out. People are going to get very sensitive on price and then the credit will dry up and then you'll have a very slow trough where people do nothing. And then eventually a lot of the bad debt, the bad you know workouts will get moved through the market. It'll get dealt with. And then people will say, okay, well, nothing's really changed. We're good. We'll start buying again and it'll slowly come up. So, I mean, that's what they're saying. Is that going to happen? I don't know. I just keep saying everyone I know keeps saying next year, there's going to be a recession. I don't know if there's going to be a recession. I think there might be a slowdown, but if there's not a recession, does that mean that our bank doesn't pivot? And in that sense, does it mean that things get moved out? And so I think that the private markets for, um, commercial real estate specifically are going to be a lot slower to change. So I think in 2024, 2025, that's when you're going to have substantial change in the commercial markets. But yesterday, Daniel and I actually were speaking to a very experienced person who he said the residential markets will go first. They're the first markets where you'll see pain and then you'll see the commercial markets. But the private markets work a lot slower than equities. Because remember the real estate the real estate market, you know, this 
private kind of illiquid market in a sense compared to equities. Equities is a market where the stock market does something first and then the economy shows it much later on because it's so sensitive. It, it happens immediately. So, predictive. Yeah. So my... sounds like a prediction to me, Jeremiah. <laughs> uh, hey? That's if I was, it's fun to make predictions because it's, you know, it keeps you intellectually honest and you have to back it up in some sense. But of course we, I have no clue. Yeah. I have no clue. So I'm just saying factually what a lot of the experienced people I've been speaking to who you know, were actually trading real estate in the eighties, we're talking guys in their seventies. Um, this is what they're telling me they think might happen. Now, whether that or not that happens, I just think one thing is true. It's going to be a lot slower to happen than we think it is, especially when you look on like, I don't know, Twitter, you know, think people think the world's ending next year. Well, so Nolan, you have a partner, don't you? That's uh, older than you. I don't know why I think that maybe I'm totally wrong, but uh, maybe you have a mentor. Like, what do you think's coming this year? I don't know why I thought yeah. that I, I saw an article. No, no partner, but um uh, you, you know, I, I think the real question is what's the next big surprise. And that's, and that's the answer to the prediction question is whenever we find out what the surprise is, is oh, uh, whenever we find out the, what the surprise is, that's how we're going to be able to determine what's going to happen in the market. Right. And I think as far as like, you know, I, I had dinner with my dad who was a realtor. He's 78 years old last night. And, and, you know, he's never seen markets like what we're going into right now. Like nobody's, the precedent that the pandemic set is a precedent that, you know, we've, you go back to my grandparents and, and they maybe might've seen something like what we're seeing right now in the, in the 1920s with respect to the amount of cash that was injected into the economy. But I mean, it, it really comes down to what's the next big surprise and nobody really knows what that is, but you know, it could be positive. It could be negative, but it's going to hit all of us upside the head and none of us really have a clue what's going to happen. Right. And we've seen the government sort of react in ways that they haven't before either, right? Which mm -hmm. is also that one sort of variable, right? Yeah. If all of a sudden they decide that they want to bail everybody out, they seem to have the stick to to wag to do that, yeah. right? Totally. So I mean, this is, I think, one of those first times in history where you can make a case for both arguments. Any one of us can make a case for both sides of the whole thing's going to crash or it's going to get significantly better. And you really have no clue which one's going to be correct. Mm -hmm. But all of us, like logically, could probably sit here and go, "Here's why it's gonna. Here's why the numbers are gonna stay where they're at, and here's why it's gonna go down forty percent." The question at this point in time, it's like we really have no idea. And mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think it's interesting. I think Jeremiah has got some really, really interesting and some really awesome insights on that. That uh, I think everything he said prior to me, from a perspective standpoint, is is pretty bang on. Like we we really don't know what's what's going to happen and the best thing we can do is just look to the past and hope that nothing nothing awful Pre happens prepare for it i mean that's what it is is that's our, as professionals we're all here you know we've got businesses we have to make decisions we have to look at best case worst case scenarios we have to advise mm -hmm. people on their situation we have to be able to walk them through an, an unfamiliar territory and be able to give them the best advice we can which is you know yeah. what they've asked us to do and so having all this information is, is important. People watching the show, listening, all the channels and social medias that you guys all have. This is how people, you know, better inform themselves because nobody does have the crystal ball. It's, it's all, it's well known. Um, just making those decisions and guiding people, uh, you know, hopefully what comes out of this is, is better guidance, you know, and, and better decisions, right? Because I think we've seen some really poor guidance and poor decisions made over the last two years. And um, that's, it's probably what led us here in the first place. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's probably the best advice right there is like, how do you, how do you backstop yourself against the worst case scenario? And, and this is for like individuals, companies, whatever, how do you backstop yourself against the worst case scenario and be prepared for what could be the best case scenario all at the same time? Pre-con baby. Pre-con. Right, Jordan? Uh, <laughs> no, but I seriously, know, man. Calgary. Pre -con yeah, yeah, Calgary. Calgary. I'll represent vast. you. Yeah. No problem. I know everything about Calgary. Never been there. What but, are you going to uh, do for the next few months? Do, no, 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 yeah. no. See, here's Calgary's the reason why, like, you sh like, and sorry, Jordan, like, the pre con thing. If you lived in Calgary between 2006 and 2018 and you bought or you were aware of pre con, we were all just sitting here watching people in Ontario and BC going, What are they doing? Because <laughs> we had those market shifts up and down where we saw like the number of people I had crying on the phone or in person between 2006 and 2018 who had bought 
pre-construction in what was a flat market or a, or a market that was slightly going down was huge. And, you know, it was just one of those things like because of that experience that we had lived in Alberta, we, we could kind of see it. And I, I mean, I put out YouTube videos in 2021 where I was like, don't buy a pre-construction, that's speculation. And I get jumped on. Right. But it, people have to go through that themselves to know that, you know, it was, it's something that's possible. Pre-constructions don't always go up in value. Right. Are you, yeah. Yeah. Look, I I'm one of the few pre-con agents in Toronto who didn't push Calgary over the past two years. And I'm pretty happy for that. Cause there's a, there's a noteworthy project closing now and appraisals aren't coming in. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, but I'll tell you, I, I, by not, by not selling Calgary, I left millions and millions on the table. Right. Yeah. Because because I have tons of clients who've called me and said, Hey, I'm buying a pre-con in Calgary. I saw a bunch of email blasts at cash flow positive, you know, eight percent appreciation a year. It makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, like, can you sell me a unit there? And it's like, no, unfortunately, I can't. I don't really work with I mean, there's one builder I work with in Toronto that builds a lot in Calgary. So other through there, sure, but through through most of the builders in Calgary, no, I can't. Can't help you. Um, but yeah, no, it's interesting to watch in real time, like right now projects that are launching in toronto are struggling it's a grind to hit their sales targets but it, but if you uh are they hitting them here in, sorry are they hitting them here i don't know it depends on the project like you, you look at a project they like forma it, right? right at two thousand bucks a foot and forma forma sold what they needed to sell and 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 theater park is right next door at you know 13 1400 a foot all day long so that was a, a surprise to me so sometimes even as somebody who sells pre-con full-time like sometimes consumers shock me and right now one of the things i'm seeing is you know it's really hard for me to sell stuff in etobicoke at 1200 a foot but it's um very easy for some of my colleagues to sell stuff in calgary at 800 a foot so it's it's very interesting to watch the capital pour from toronto into calgary through this downturn well and they've shifted their tactics right like um, wasn't there there's a project right downtown toronto that sold extremely well sure young street yeah yeah eight elm did really really well sure now but they, oh. they they'll probably be okay. When is that thing gonna close? That's like seventy stories. Like that thing won't be built for twenty years. I, I right think you'll now. be getting a lot longer uh, closings now. They'll be like, all right, twenty thirty one, the best project downtown uh, is being launched. Hundred percent now. VTBs We've got the... fifteen hundred worksheets. You know, all the developers are gonna be lenders soon. Yeah, I, it's that's also a testament to my point. Zero percent deposit. Um. Eight Elm and, and Forma are testament to my point earlier about like, it's it's funny that, you know, a lot of people think that price is their primary consideration when they're buying pre-con, but truthfully, like they just want to feel like they got something other people couldn't because, um, you know, y- you look at a project like Pinnacle uh, Sky Tower, right? 95 stories young and, and, um, and Queens Key there. And uh, they had, they recently did a price increase, but Around the same time as Forma and Eight Elm were launching, they had units, all kinds of one and dens at at fourteen hundred a square foot, which is only a hundred dollars a square foot more than resale trades at Harbor Plaza and at Ten York. Yet those units sat there while people ate up two thousand bucks a foot at Eight Elm and, and and Forma. So again, it just goes. Is that to show what Eight Elm went for? Close to it, like seventeen fifty to eighteen fifty. Yeah, depending on the size of the unit, it depended a lot on the size of the unit. Um, wow. but, uh, like just the really small stuff, but anyways, the, po- the point I'm making is just like, Yikes. you know, the pre-con market is anything but rational. Um, and at, at least for the last few years, it's been like that. So where do we go from here, Vaz? What's next? What are you, I, what are you I, worried I, about next year? And what are you excited for next year? Well, like I said, from the Twitter space, I was a little bit taken back that we're going to 2016 prices. So I reserve judgment. I've, uh, when I've used logic against the city of Toronto, I've been punched in the face every single time when I've thought it's going to go down. So I'm just going to leave you with, this is my most comprehensive. I don't know. So I'm obviously, <laughs> look, I'm actually a little bit bullish, low key bullish, but I am concerned. And I think Nolan made a good point. Like I'm preparing. I So I bought in 21 personally in 22, in 2022, I also bought, but I backed out. And thankfully the guy let me off the hook. It was off market. So that saved me because I would have probably lost my shirt. And in 2023, I want to buy again, but I will kind of rotate out of some assets and to go into something else. And it has more to do with Bill 23 than anything. What are um, you buying? Sorry? What are you buying? No, this is just personal. So this is personal, like residential stuff. So oh, I want to like kind of see- you're buying houses. Okay. Yeah, houses. So what I'm thinking now is with this- 
uh, MTSA thing with Bill 23, like the major transportation stations, if you're within X amount of space, let's say if you pick up something that's R1 zone, what can you do with it? We, we don't know yet, but this is kind of what I'm thinking. So let's say, do I unload a condo downtown to get into something like that to maybe capitalize on the future? I don't know, right? So low key, that's what I'm thinking, but I am concerned, right? I mean, if we have what Abe calls the duration of these rates for the next two years, let's say, um, it's not going to be pretty, man. Wait, 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 Jordan, you you smirk, but do you think that we're going to see a reversal? No, I'm kind of indifferent, to be honest. I'm done predicting. Um, like, I'm really indifferent where the market goes. People on Twitter are always giving me shit. They're telling me I'm going to be in the bread lines. But like, <laughs> the truth is I live on 10%. I live on about 11% of my income. So I'm not overly <laughs> concerned with what the market does. Um, but I but I will say, like, I, f I really feel for it. Like, if the assignment market is any leading indicator, then I then I'm then I'm actually quite bearish, um, at least for the next year, because the I, the the amount of pain I'm seeing in the assignment market is is really something else, and the lack of liquidity that like there's just it's really hard to unload assignments at 2018 pre comp pricing right now, and that kind of scares me. Like I have people who are selling their units for what they purchased them for in 2018, and it's and it's hard to find a bid on those. And do these Part people have is, one, or are they like they have multiple that they're trying? Well, usually to they have one. Like, When's the closing? A, uh, like now, yeah, 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 right. So that's, that's like, the problem is is nobody really wants to close right now. Yeah. Sure. Um, like I, I like I'll have buyers who tell me they're looking for a deal, and I show them something that's a 2018 purchase. I'm like, after commissions, this individual is losing money on this deal. It's you know fifty to seventy thousand dollars cheaper than a resale unit in the building across the street. So you you're front running a bit of a discount here. And they'll tell me, well, do you have anything closing in three years? And I'm like, well, yeah, I do, but you're going to pay more than resale. You're not getting a deal on that type of product, right? So they want to have their cake and eat it too. It's really hard to satisfy investors right now. Very, very difficult. Hmm. Yeah, but listen, I, out there. I, look, I, I, I want to not be buying and I have something tied up. And then part of me is like, oh, <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, this is Darryl, what, are you, what are you buying, Daryl? Are you buying income or are you buying development land? No, it's a great development site in one of these MTSAs that Vaz is talking about. Like, it's a brilliant play, but I'm afraid to, like, finance the thing for a few years. That's fair. I'm inve I'm investing one, too. I'm, I'm putting some money into a land assembly near an MTSA with a developer I know. But so, I mean, I like I think the world's going to end, but I also think that it's going to continue at some well point. That's the thing is like, I'm just like going, okay, just stick to the plan. Just stick to the plan. Keep going. And I'm like, holy fuck. Maybe this is another stupid Frankfurt plan here. What the hell is going to come from this? I don't know. Because it's all going to be about timing right now. Right. And at least I've been working on this one for a while. So like my sellers are not really um, in tune with the current marketplace. Right. Like they think so it's still old pricing. So. I, I, st I tell people to then sit and wait. <laughs> sure. Like realistically, you know, there should be some discount to last year. It just, it's just the way it is. Like we were in, when you look at the amount of money pumped into the market, it kind of makes sense, right? There was like what, $14 trillion pumped into the markets around the world. Like you have, you have effectively the different types of asset bubbles have come down. They've taken that cash out like the crypto market. Was yeah. like four, you know, four trillion or something taken out of the stock market. Was like three. I trillion. just saw. I just saw a tweet somebody put up. I think it was like eighteen trillion dollars has been taken out of the market this year. Yeah, and that's yeah, and that's kind of realistically where the market need to go. Need Which to means that everything up. that went in yeah. is out, and rates are seven billion times higher. And I think is there billion. anybody on this panel that doesn't think we're going to get at least one more increase next year? Anyone? Jordan? No. So everybody thinks it's still going up. They've <laughs> the taken bull. out 18 trillion. Unemployment is still like, what is it under 2%? Some fucking scary, stupid number. Yeah. But Daryl, I always, I always, I always fight this number. I don't think the unemployment is as low as you think it is because the, the way that they, they trend that data or they track that data rather is quite different. Then, Bro, if you saw my roofing crew, you'd think it was even lower that number because I guarantee you those guys are not on any list anywhere. 
and that there there's the reverse of that like i'm no no number makes sense but you can see just out there like my daughter went in to get a job she left the place with the job along with five other people you see no, people that, getting like 20. 20 grand more to just move to this other company like it's crazy still right now but that's they, my they, point is that there's there's more jobs everywhere because there's all kinds of little ways to make cash Right. right. So you have people like Jordan knows this better than most. I mean, you have people who are making money off of any kind of online platform. So, the, sure. so you know, they, they're not in the labor pool, so they don't need to get a job. Right. They're not actually out there looking. So I think the numbers are completely skewed. Like I'm in Hawaii right now and my little with my little brother and my brother's friend from LA and the one fellow, he runs an influencer management company and he's got a hundred different influencers and like 50 of them make over a million a year. Like we're talking like one, one girl is telling me that um, she makes $120,000 just from one fashion company to post per year. And that's just one company. Like these are like this, the world of employment has completely changed. And you can make money anywhere because true. you have access to employment anywhere, right? So you can pull in from any kind of labor pool across the world. So I don't think the labor numbers are as correctly, you know, I guess, defining what our market is doing today because it's not going to actually matter. And that's why there's so much money anywhere, everywhere is because you can pull little bits amount of money from everywhere. So until you have like mass chaos across the entire world, I don't think those numbers are going to change. And so well, Tiff if and this all isn't mass said, chaos, what does mass chaos around the world look like? If this is not, well, that's the thing. Like, that's, you know, that's like great depression era stuff, which I don't mm. think is going to happen. And I hope it isn't going to happen. So in other words, like Tiff is looking for pain. I don't think, I think he'll see some pain, but it's not going to be on the records that the great financial crisis had because there's not enough people in the labor pool actually being part of the data set because they're out there, you know, like the Jordans of the world, they're putting, you know, content out and they're able to make money off YouTube off. I don't know, off all kinds of different platforms. Right. It's so, not even just, it's not even just the content creators. There's a whole market on the back of that of just oh people who God. eyeball are arbitrage. Like I, I know so many young people in their twenties that are just like social media managers and they have 10 clients, right. And, or they're, or they're Facebook ad managers or Google ad managers. And they're not even that good at Google ads, but they're making, you know, quarter million dollars a year. Like there's tons and tons and tons. Of, it's crazy. It's a, it's wild out there. I, I couldn't agree agree more and that's why i think the numbers that the economists are looking at that the bank is looking at they're not reflective of what is actually going on and not actually in a, a bad way actually in a good way like i just think there's not enough people in the labor pool who are doing exactly what uh you know the fed is saying they're doing and then on top of that you have i mean the market has changed substantially but you have cryptocurrencies creating a, a secondary form of capital that was not being tracked by the different tax agencies, right? So you have all kinds of different employment that are getting, that have access to labor pools across the, you know, the globe. You have cryptocurrencies, which are not being tracked by the tax agencies as closely. So you have all kinds of like noise in the employment sector. So what happens is that the Fed and the BOC and these different, you know, uh, and these different monetary, uh, um, central monetary banks are trying to look at the policy and say, well, wait a second, like these things are sticky. They're not changing. They're not changing. Right. So change I think the policy, well, eventually they will change, you know, eventually they will have some movement for sure, but I just don't think it'll be on the levels, the great financial crisis even. And on top of that, they'll have to be very sensitive. Like if they see things move 2%, then that'll probably be, you know, indicative of a much larger move across the globe than it would be in the past, right? So in other words, all I'm trying to say is that I think the market has changed. There is a shift in the way that investors look at things, that economists look at things. We are in a paradigm shift for the next, you know, kind of iteration of what our global economy is going to be. And that means that the governments, you know, they control a lot more of the policy and that there is more global outflows of, of capital um, 
meaning that people can make money across the globe, which changes the way that policies change. And then therefore, you know, change the way people live and work and play and eat. And so I just think, and, and that's why, you know, Vasily is very correct. Like we can't make prediction because the economy is so complex now. So you can make crazy. minutia of predictions maybe in like, you know, regional basis. But yeah, but then something major comes and like destroys the whole argument. Like we, exactly. I'm telling you, when, when, like me, Jordan, TK and uh, Foch, we did a show uh, uh, about Evergrande like a year and a bit ago, right? And we had like such a great discussion and it made so much sense. And we made some great predictions like looking back, but then, hey, throw like a war in the middle of that thing and boom, like the whole model explodes, right? And so there's so many looming things out there. I think Patrick was saying it before and we've said it before, like there's so many different things that are getting thrown or potentially thrown into this crazy stew right now that yeah you can make a prediction but like good fucking luck but so how do you navigate and how do you invest and how do you borrow and lever and buy into the future of this thing like that's that's a very good point and like something that my clients ask me all the time on the commercial side of things and i quite literally what i've been telling everyone from day one to begin with, you have to have prudent underwriting. You have to understand what can I control in the property, right? So if you buy a property, you don't buy it hoping it to go up in value. You buy it because you know you can increase the value. So that means quite frankly, you're buying something and you're fixing it up. You're adding a tenant, you know, you're adding efficiencies, efficiencies to the bottom line. Uh, you're creating entitlements. Like I think in the next stage of investment, it's going to be those who do and do prudently. And I think that's a healthy market. It's really good because like, you know, for a lot of those on the call today, it means that you have to put in real work to get out outcome and you have to have incentive to do so, of course, but it means that the world of a speculation is ending. And I think that's a good thing for our market because it, it incentivizes greed because it incentivizes someone trying to, to take advantage of a market that they don't control, but that the market is gonna give them money, right? So in fact, you have everyday investors, like, you know, everyone I know is like, oh, you know, I'm buying a house, so, you know, I'm gonna flip it or something like, and they're just buying it and hoping it's gonna go up in value. Mm -hmm. And so I think the next iteration of our market is gonna be a lot of CapEx coming in to improve your market, a lot of people who can add something by putting in a tenant, creating efficiencies in the NOI, it's real work is going to have outcome for incentive. And I think that's the way the market should work. If you put something in, you should get something out of it. If you put hard work in, and I think that's the best way to look into the future is, hey, I need to control the next 24 to 36 months of my cash flow. And I need to control what my debt service is going to be. I have to have insight into that you know, and I have to underwrite prudently. And then I have to know what can I control to add value into the property, whether it's commercial or whether it's residential. Um, I think that's extremely important. Control what you know. So we're gonna, we've been talking for a couple hours now. This has been so fantastic, guys. Really appreciate everybody's time. I want to ask one last question, unless TK, TK, what do you got going on? We're good. We're good. We're wrapping we're it good. up. So yeah. we're wrapping it up, baby. So yeah. if somebody had money, they're sitting on the sidelines right now and they wanted to invest, not a lot of money, 50 grand, a hundred grand. Where's the opportunity in 2023? Assignment sales. Assignment <laughs> sales. Put somebody out of the And you got to borrow prices. with a hundred grand. You got to borrow against that. Now you're, f now you're, who's got ratios with a house and like to buy an investment property right now? Everybody still the Uber I don't know. drivers, See, uh, my client, it seems like a lot of people, I don't know, selection bias, I guess. But to me, like what I see is a lot of people, hmm. lots of room. I yeah, think there's actually some opportunity with private lending right now on specific private assets lending. within the city of Toronto. To be honest with you, like That's what I was thinking, you can get 12, 15 points in some cases on something. Honestly, I wouldn't mind taking over. Not that you would do it like that, but I would feel comfortable. So but I, I don't know. I'm not in that, in that space and um, seeing what some people are going through right now, trying to get their money out and having trouble doing it. There's some risk, but like, I mean, 50 to a hundred grand right now, 
there's not much you can do. Like, I mean, just kind of sit back and wait, I guess. We've well, talked about this before, actually, with condos and, and why people buy condos, because they're all individual investors and how the developers, you know, each one of those um, investors just share their pool of the expense. I think what should go back, and it's kind of everything that everyone's been talking about, boils down to the same thing, is that the people who have been investing over the last two years shouldn't have been. They didn't have the knowledge. And I think that people should be teaming up with experience. I think there's people out there who are full-time investors that I meet all the time who are just, they're great at their job. That's all they do. They don't do anything else. They're developers full-time. They're multifamily apartment building owners. You know, they know how to reposition assets better than anyone because they've invested in the time and knowledge. And I think, you know, having mom and pop investors invest in guys like that is going to be a safe investment because they have tried and true methods and, and that they're going to be able to bring everyone through. They have the highest chance of bringing everyone through this because buying an assignment, buying a house, buying a condo, buying a, a duplex, like all those things are going to come with a higher degree of risk risk today than they have in, in a long time. And I think that, you know, you get somebody who's got more experience, who's really understanding the markets, who knows how to negotiate the deals. Um, and you're just throwing in, whether it be private lending or anything else like that, you can be throwing your hat in. You know, Jeremiah's talking about a land deal. Daryl's talking about land deals. I think they're out there. And uh, with the right team, I think that there's going to be people making money and pass the buck on to somebody who's doing it full time. So I would if you guys have any good deals to put, to put money into, let me know. Um, I, I, I think if someone has fifty dollars to $100,000, depending on whether they're an accredited investor or not, I think they should invest in with specialists. Like you look, and this isn't common in Canada, but it's very common in the US, the GPLP model. That means that a general partner who is a specialist, who is an operator, they go and they buy a certain type of real estate and they're raising money through an LP, a limited partnership. And so you as an investor can put money into this limited partnership, which is protecting you from any kind of liability. And then you get a set return. You pay that GP generally management fees, and a disproportionate um, uh, profit share to do good work. So you're aligned, but that is something where I would put my money and I would concentrate on specialists who have a track record. Like I'll give you a good example. There's a guy in Texas who is strictly investing in class B industrial, and he's been hitting 20 to 30% IRRs, sometimes higher uh, for a long time. He has a very good track record. So that's someone who you can put $50,000 in and you can turn your $50,000 into $100,000 in effectively, you know, four years, right? So, um, I mean, that's just based on his past track record. It could change, but it, but he's been only buying Class B industrial in the Texas area. So he knows it better than anyone. And he knows like, I'm going to buy a building that's undervalued. I'm going to add in a tenant. The tenant's going to pay rent that's higher than the owner thought was possible, or I'm just going to find a tenant for a vacant building and I'm going to underwrite, you know, prudently. There's another example, a guy who only buys uh, strip centers on the California coast and on the New York coast. And he buys strip centers that don't have any tenancies and their vacancies in them. And he puts tenants into them. So he stabilizes them with cash flow. He, he's been hitting consistent 20 to 25% um, returns. So like there are lots of examples of great operators. Um, you do have to be an accredited investor, but these are the types of people you can put 50 to hundred thousand dollars and invest with them. And you can make, you know, at least 10, if not 20% returns on some of these operators, because they're very good at what they do. And they're specialists. Whereas, you know, we, in Canada, we, we, we solely look at the residential home. We look at the condo, right. And, I, it's not to say that those aren't good investments in some cases. I mean, like, listen, I agree with Jordan. <laughs> if people are selling assignments, they're losing money and they're at, you know, four to five year you know, prices um, in the past, you know, they might be a good investment. But I just think that a lot of people have forgot about commercial property, which is effectively the backbone of the economy. And they need to learn there is investment in Canada outside of a home, you know, where someone lives. That's my and bias. you can finance it now, right? You can finance your investment. Oh, no, you can finance industrial and commercial now, like way easier yeah, than at, at, land, at rates, right? right? But we're talking about someone investing fifty to a hundred thousand dollars, right? Right, right. Look, 
look for a good operator, invest as an LP and learn what they do, right? And if people are looking like, well, I don't know where you find those people. Like if, if you talk to enough people in the industry, you will be able to find those who invest money. But it's not, I would say it's not as common in Canada as it is in the US. And I hope that it does become common because I think there is a complete world outside of residential home investing that is really important. Big, well, biggest contrib contributor to that is greed. People say, well, why would I want to only take us one point or two points or whatever? I can go and get the whole thing. And I heard my guy, he, uh, he th tripled his money. Hopefully the greed disappears and people go into more responsible investing. Um, yeah. Nolan, what do you think? Uh, uh, I think the answer to that question depends largely on, is it your only $50,000 or do you got another million dollars kicking around in, uh, in assets that can protect you if, uh, if something goes wrong, you know, if it's, it's, if it's your only $50,000 and you don't own a single family home, it's probably a good time to buy a single family home. Um, it might not be the bottom, but it's definitely not the top. If, uh, you know, if you get a couple hundred grand kicking around and you want to buy a, a residential rental property, it might be a good idea. Um, you know, I, I think it largely comes down to your risk profile. And, and I think that's going to be the uh the word of the day in in 2023 is is risk profile and and you know everyone's gonna have to make their decisions based on that and just a quick note on condos so uh in 2021 i bought one where it was in the high teens in terms of irr and i made all my money on the purchase it was a botched listing caught the covid lockdown all that stuff so i tied it up beautiful now, with the current prices of condos where they're at right now, to get that same IRR, you need prices in resale to be 20% roughly lower than where they are today based on rates. So I just want to leave that with people because if you because people are still going to try to buy condos because they want to use leverage, they want to use, they want to buy something local that they're familiar with. So Time. from where today prices are, you still need another 20%. So if you can, I don't know, if you buy something tenanted or whatever, where you can squeeze out a massive discount you have to be 20% below current market to hit decent IRR that's like worth your while. You can squeeze out a massive dis discount on the assignment side. You just have to be uh, cognizant that there's going to be closing costs and factor that into the price you're paying. Yeah. And what would you estimate those closing costs? They're like 6 to 8%? Yeah, like closer to 8 with market okay. levies and stuff. Um, but like, yeah, you want to have it obviously reviewed by a lawyer and make sure those caps survive uh, assignment stuff. The assignments are really nasty right now. You you have to protect yourself as a buyer, but man, some of the discounts I'm seeing are pretty, pretty wild. Well, folks, you heard it all here. We've had a wonderful day. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, guys. I can't think of something I'd rather do on any day than to talk to all the people that we talk to. What a, what? no, How but many? honestly, what like, holy have, like cow. 13? I don't know. Uh, we were supposed to, one person did not end up showing up, but that's okay. Ugh. That's okay. Although it was a female. So, I mean, we look very masculine heavy on this show regularly, but uh, Hey, listen, we tried, we had a couple of women on. That was nice, but what a bunch of brains and what a bunch of experience and who knows what the hell's going to happen. TK, not I feel us. a little bit smarter now though. I'll tell you that much. I feel a little bit better. I feel, about I feel educated. I got educated by everyone today. I like. It. I feel education. worse about things. I was really bullish. <laughs> You're yesterday. supposed things to. Going You're well supposed future, to, bro. But I'm more yeah, educated. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. guys keep bringing me down to earth. I hate. I hate coming on here. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, so, we appreciate you guys. Happy New Year, uh, you and all your families. Uh, we look forward to 2023. We want to get you all back on the show and uh, Please, you know share yeah. about where things are at. So. Keep sorry about work. the long wait times and sorry we didn't get to talk to everybody as long as we normally would and like to. So uh, we'll have to definitely get everybody that was on here back on again for a full episode. Um, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you to everybody that actually watches and listens to this Two show. Hours, if I don't you're know still what the hell is wrong with wow. you. But yeah, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, get a job. Everybody, have a great 2023 or at the very least better than 2022. <laughs>